for the one or two of you in the audience who are young enough not to know me. Uh, I started this job many years ago as a younger alumnus, and I've now become an older alumnus. And it has nothing to do with the job. It has to do with this natural process we all go through. Welcome back to Technology Day. For those of you who are my contemporaries or a bit older, uh, this is Saturday morning class. For you young people, when they softened up MIT, they don't have Saturday morning class anymore. But uh, we're all accustomed to it. And in the thing we call the real world, which is not MIT, there is always Saturday morning class. My job is to welcome you all, uh, to get you in your chairs, and to introduce the man who is a gift to us, the second gift to us from the University of Michigan. Uh, we had a great president given to us many years ago named Jerry Wiesner from the University of Michigan. And uh, lightning struck again a number of years ago when Chuck Vest joined us. Without any further ado, Chuck Vest, president of MIT. Thank you very much, Bill. Good morning, and welcome home to all of you. Uh, before we begin the excursion into what I think of as serious fun this morning, I do have a uh, somewhat more serious announcement that I have been asked to make by the registrar. He informed me this morning that due to some sort of an archival error, the registrar no longer has documentary evidence that certain MIT graduates successfully completed their swimming tests. <laughs> These graduates are therefore required to retake the swimming test immediately. Failure to comply with this will result in revocation of your degrees. As far as we can tell, the lost records are those belonging to all graduates of the classes of 1957, 62, 67, 72, 77, 82, and 87. So you're asked to report over to the uh, alumni pool immediately. Staff are there prepared to administer the test, and we hope you can hurry back before the end of today's program. Good luck to all of you. Now, where was I? Today, as I said, it really is a real pleasure to welcome all of you back home to the MIT campus. And we are indeed going to engage in something that goes on around here all the time, which we call serious fun. This is a place of serious work, of serious purpose, but also of serious humor and serious fun. And I'm sure that's something that hasn't changed since the days you were here as students. There's always been a complex intermingling of fun and, uh, excuse me, of work and of play here at MIT. One reason for this is, of course, that the heart of the Institute, namely its student body, remains forever young. Some people say that staying on the faculty at an institution like this is a little bit like living in the funny papers. Nobody's age ever seems to change. And that's something we value deeply. But of course, young people prefer to blend pleasure together with their labor. And actually, it's my observation that most of you continue to do that as well. Now, a reason that the brilliance of this community is often and fortunately paired with a vigorous, if sometimes warped, sense of humor and fun is pretty obvious. Uh, there are lots of scholarly writings on the analogies between humor and scientific discovery. These things are all quite well known. Both humor and scientific discover, uh, discovery very frequently have in common the sudden merging of two seemingly very disparate ideas. This conjugation is something that I think we all have the good fortune to experience from time to time. So it really is no surprise that humor and sports and games and other diversions are prominent features of the Institute's landscape. Another reason, I suppose, is that this is an extraordinarily competitive community. And the desire to excel infects our play every bit as much as it does our work. And finally, a last reason I might cite that play is important to us, and it goes right to the heart of something that's very valuable in an MIT education. Because this is a research university, 
and because Paul Gray and so many others on our faculty and staff over the years have helped to really integrate our undergraduates into their research programs, it's fair to say that one of the favorite catchphrases around the Institute, a little bit in parallel to our traditional uh, learning by doing, might also be learning by playing. And that, of course, is a very familiar phenomenon to all of us. Connections between creativity and playfulness, between intellectual acuity and physical vigor, between mental agility and body, bodily agility are well established. Now that's what I was told to say, but as I was thinking about it this morning, uh, I came up with a few counterexamples to that statement that I think I could cite as well. But on the whole, it's correct. It's for this very reason that we invest so heavily in facilities and programs for both physical and mental recreation. And it's also why our students and our faculty and our staff invest so much of their time and energy in these vital, rewarding, and stimulating pursuits. Let me expand on this just for a moment by saying a couple of words about MIT's athletic programs. Among American universities, MIT ranks a close second to the number of varsity teams it fields for intercollegiate competition. Harvard beats us, we understand, by two squads. We field about 39, and they have 41. This is a truly extraordinary number if you stop to think about it. By the time they graduate, around a quarter of our MIT students have participated in varsity sports, often reaping the rewards that come from teamwork, from training, from challenge, and from competition. In fact, one of the anecdotes that I tell people that I come across around the country and world who really don't know a lot about MIT, which to me explained a lot of our spirit when I first came here, is the following. Uh, Becky and I follow a tradition that Paul and Priscilla started of hosting our seniors for dinner in a series of eight or nine evenings at the President's House in February. In my first year here, I was sitting at the table next to a very petite young woman who was graduating in physics. And I asked her what she was interested in doing in addition to physics. And she told me that she played women's varsity ice hockey. And I said, well, that's really terrific. And trying to make a little small talk, I said, did you play ice hockey in high school? And she looked at me very seriously and she said, President Vest, I couldn't even skate when I was in high school. And this year, another senior stood up, also a young woman, at, at this evening, and she said, you know, the thing that I have valued most about MIT is the number of firsts. And what I mean by that is the number of things I did for the first time when I came here. And I think that's a lot of the spirit that infuses all of our activities in athletics, in theater, in music, and so forth. Very often, young people trying out, exploring things for the first time, and flowering in ways that no one would ever have predicted. So we think a lot about the importance of intercollegiate sports and club sports and recreation here at the Institute. In addition, of course, there are, as I said, intramural and club activities of all kinds, the workout rooms, the swimming pool, the tennis courts, the squash courts, the basketball courts, the playing fields, and all the other facilities that MIT students have at their disposal are very important elements of the campus. And of course, beyond athletics, there are countless other opportunities for our students to learn by playing, literally, in music, in theater, in dance, in art. And of course, what begins as play, and that was really the meaning of my couple of anecdotes a moment ago, what often begins as play ends up in deep intellectual and artistic exploration and creativity. And as if all this weren't enough, we offer another resource that provides considerable opportunity for ingenious play. Our students have virtually unlimited access to the use of the new of the internet. At MIT, the use of computers and the World Wide Web, which of course we manage here, are not only essential tools of education, they also provide whole worlds of recreational opportunities, and every now and then, some of these are even constructive. 
Given the enthusiasm with which MIT students, faculty, and staff alike have embraced the internet and the World Wide Web as a tool for both work and play, it's no wonder that just a few weeks ago, we were ranked number one most wired college or university in the United States by Yahoo, the Internet Life Online Magazine. We're still not sure exactly what this means, but we love things that say we're number one, so we're going to accept it. <laughs> in all these ways, and in a good many more, work and play are, in fact, intertwined in the pursuit of knowledge here at the Institute. It's a tradition of which we are proud and for which I believe we will continue to write new chapters. And I think that will give you a little sense of what this morning and the day are really going to be all about. Now, we're going to continue this morning in a pretty informal manner. We're not going to have a lot of very lengthy introductions. In a moment, I will introduce our very first speaker of the morning, and he will be followed in succession by three others. Seymour Papert of the MIT Media Lab, who I think is known to many of you as the originator of the Logo program, someone who has devoted a career to merging the cognitive sciences and computing technology with a particular emphasis on learning, particularly by children. Seymour will be followed by Ed Crawley, the head of our Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, a person who conducts a lot of his playtime uh, a few thousand feet in the air with no motor. And I don't know, Ed, if you're going to say anything about that today, but uh, uh, Ed is, uh, is indeed a glider pilot, soaring pilot, and I think has been just a uh, terrific driving force sort of bringing in the new generation of engineering education at MIT, as has the speaker who follows him, Woody Flowers, who, uh, if anyone can say uh, uh, that the following speaker needs no introduction, it surely has to be Woody, so I'm not going to say anything more about Woody. Our first speaker, I think, is going to be a real treat for all of us, Steve Jacobson. Uh, Steve received his doctorate degree here in the Mechanical Engineering Department in 1973. Today, he is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Utah, but also holds appointments there in both computer science, in bioengineering, and in the Department of Surgery in their medical school. Steve directs the University of Utah's Center for Engineering Design, which has collaborated with a number of corporate partners in creating several of today's most exciting and advanced applications of engineering technology. His career as a, as a teacher and a technological innovator offers ample proof that engineering, of course, can be useful, but it also can be fun and fascinating all at the same time. Steve. Hello? Oh, here we go. Good. Well, uh, it's great to be here. I, uh, as President Vest said, uh, left here in 1973, and I was actually uh, an office mate of uh, Woody. So I go back a long time. Also, as a student of Bob Mann, who I see is in the, uh, in the uh, audience. Uh, one thought I had when we were discussing, uh, or President Vest was discussing athletics, was that this morning I couldn't find anybody who knew that the jazz won. They'd say, what's a jazz? And. Uh, <laughs> The Jazz are in a death struggle here with Michael Jordan, if anybody follows basketball. Yeah. OK, I'll stand on the side. And uh, so it was important to me to find out. Uh, actually, what I thought about, too, was a lecture I got once about MIT and athletics, which I thought was really important. And that was that the purpose of athletics at MIT, this was my own conclusion, was for participation, not observation. And so uh, whereas spectator sports are great things, the idea at MIT was to give an opportunity for people to get involved in every kind of sport. And I happen to agree that that's probably the best, uh, the best way for a university to behave. As a little background so I can explain uh, my biases, and I have to go over and get the clicker here, the uh, laser printer, is uh, I've kind of got a weird background. I went back to Utah, actually, because they'd give me some freedoms that I couldn't get at other places, and that was to, to do some things directly and very tightly with industry. And so I started a, a place called the Center for Engineering Design. And then at one point, we founded a company called Sarcos, 
And we were all interested in doing design, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But we were interested in turning ideas into things, but I mean, like really, not, not uh, just talk about it. And we now grew to about 150 people, and we have about 20 associates, and an average of about uh, 13 adult graduate students. And by adults, we mean that they fully know where they want to go and that they have experience. And uh, they come from a lot of different fields. There's a spider there. Uh, from uh, engineering to science to medicine to art, business, and uh, manufacturing. And in fact, uh, I guess now we have in the group about 15 sculptors that are quite good at what they do. And we do projects for commercial, government, and internal sponsors. And we usually have about 30 projects going on, ranging from building robotic butterflies for Steve Wynn for his new hotel, Bellagio, to doing uh, uh, things that I'll classify, since we're talking about fun, as deep fun. Now, there's fun fun, and there's hard fun, and then there's deep fun. And deep fun is where there's more pain than there is pleasure. <laughs> and sometimes at the end, there's ecstasy. And, uh, but for sure, one thing is true, you're always in a position where you can lose. And because we take projects that are basically fixed budget and fixed schedule, and we embed the R&D kinds of activities we want to do in those projects. And it's a grueling thing, but it's something we believe in because it keeps you from dallying in the valley. We, uh, we do commercial design, not designology. And we believe in all methods of design, CAD CAM for sure, and then one that I used to talk about, which is called PodPOM. And PodPOM is plain old design, and plain old manufacturing, where you think. <laughs> and I have, a, I have a personal bias for computers and against computers. The thing for is they're facilitators, but the thing that's bad about them is too many times you believe them. And uh, so if something comes out of a computer to us is just a prototype. Uh, it's not gospel. We, we get involved uh, in a lot of different areas, and I have a reason for talking about this, but uh, you can't read all these, and Bob Mann will give me trouble for having too much on my slide. But we get involved in medicine, entertainment, human interactive systems, and microsystems. And that means microcatheters to go in your brain. And we're actually commercializing that now. Programmable drug delivery systems that we're commercializing for things like controlling clots or cancer or whatever. Some diabetic catheters, uh, artificial limbs. The artificial limb project started here. Uh, entertainment of all sorts, a lot of casinos, Disney, Jurassic Park, Universal, and so on. Uh, robots to go under the sea. And since all of these things need sensors and computers and actuators, we do a lot of work in microsystems, and that is using modern technologies for miniaturization to build interesting systems. And also, you'll see as I discuss things, and uh, this is sort of a plea to schools to you know, not, have, not have areas so nicely defined. One nice thing about MIT was they didn't really see departments as the only place you could work. And so at Utah, I got involved in a lot of places, and I just want to announce that since I've also got a position in surgery, I do cheap surgery. So if you, anybody's got any problems, see me after. But uh, we get involved in machines that take information to control them. And that sounds like a trite term, and it's a horrible uh, uh, anyway statement. But it means machines that basically use sensors, actuators, controllers, structures, and conduits that have high levels of interdependence. And you'll see when you see the robots that uh, there's sensors, actuators, structures, controllers, and so on that all work together, and if any one little part doesn't work, then they don't work. So they're nightmares. The Disney robots we built had up to 50 actuators and 100 sensors in a single robot, and you can see when one of them doesn't work. When we did the project for European Disneyland, it was 9,000 sensors, 4,000 actuators, all sorts of computers and structures and so on, and rubber faces and clothing and so on, and so it all had to work. We also believe in design tools using computers. And again, you can't live without them, but you can die with too many of them. So uh, today we were going to talk about technology at play. And you can interpret that a lot of different ways. And uh, we talked in the title about sports, games, and toys. And we've been involved in some toys. Oh, I didn't bring one up with me, but uh, some Mickey Mouse watches and some little shooter systems and so on that actually are quite technical devices. But they're, they're uh, toys. But we sort of led away and got involved in some other areas, which are theme parks and casinos and location-based entertainment and exhibitions and shows. And we've had some rather sizable projects in those areas. And just so we don't go to sleep, I thought I'd show you just a, a short clip on tape number three 
of this fellow. This is one of the sculpts for uh, Jurassic Park, the ride, and he's in clay, and I'll show you how we come about uh, having those, but he's really wonderful, isn't he? He's so big and fully packed. Why don't you uh, show tape three, please? This is T-Rex 1. You gotta turn up the sound. Yeah, there we go. And this is T-Rex 2. See another shot. This is coming out of the bottom at about 60 miles an hour. And uh, now you'll see a side view of this robot. You'll see some people in a second moving around to show you the size. You can turn that off now. Just put it on pause. So, uh, and we'll get back to that kind of thing, but just to give you a little uh, preview, those are really not uh, unserious fun. He's 80,000 pounds. He's above the clients or the guests, and he comes out over them, and so he has to work all the time, and he has to be dynamic, and, and so on. So. Uh, the, uh, the process of achieving him was, uh, was not straightforward. So one thing people ask us when they, by the way, when they see the, uh, the list of all the projects we work on, the venture capital say you're crazy, and uh, other people say you're crazy. Your wife certainly says you're crazy. Uh, but uh, we're sort of addicts in the place, and you have a lot of them around here. I tell people usually MIT's uh, sort of full of addicts of various kinds uh, addicted to their work. But, we actually talked about it in our group of uh, maybe the 50 central people and says, why do we keep taking these projects? The last one that came to us, they wanted us to do Godzilla, giant new kind of Godzilla, not a big furry bear. And, uh, and we actually turned them down. It was amazing. But uh, we decided we love machines, not more than our families, but the whole process of scheming it takes to define a new machine and the teamwork necessary to build competitive systems, and I emphasize competitive because the things we do are competitive, and uh, they're economically competitive. Understanding the technologies and the manufacturing methods required to make them. If you take a look at the T-Rex, there's every kind of uh, computer process to analyze them. There's fiberglass and rubber and clay systems and foam systems, all sorts of different parts, and these have to run, as I'll talk, in terrible environments. Uh, the educational process is necessary to create a team that can compete in the real marketplace, and uh, especially in the entertainment marketplace, it's sort of like hamburger. It just sort of churns people up. One of the jokes is that the companies keep going bankrupt, and the people just move to two to different companies. So the company names change, but the people never change. They just move to a different company. We like the participants, the students, and I don't just mean young students. Anybody who does this has to be an old student if they're old. And the competition is fun. It's, uh, it's great to win, and it's great to have the motivation to win. Another thing we like regarding machines, which isn't talked about a lot, is the people aspects of them. And uh, both Woody and I collect a bunch of old things, and we look at them maybe different than other people. Uh, I always look at them and I wonder about their relationship with people, like who were the users, and who needed the machine, and who was the manufacturer, and what were their biases? What was the technology that was available in terms of material, knowledge, and tools? who paid the bill and why they did it, and uh, what was the price, and why did they pick a particular look? I always think I was mentioning Woody about Harley Davidson motorcycles. They're clearly not motorcycles, but I said they're uh, sort of a rolling American trophy, which is wonderful too, and it's perfectly great to have them. But uh, if you do start thinking about machines in those ways, I think you understand uh, that we're not any smarter now than we were there then, and they were as smart as we are. And what you do is you work with the tools you have. Uh, scientists have a certain role, which has to do with discovering nature, uh, issues in nature, and also finding a, a, a discovery suitable for their tombstone, some immortal result. And engineers take that information and refine it for use. And designers, though, just try to do the best they can at the time with the tools they have and with the things they have. And so. Uh, it's a little bit different field. Well, how we began doing this kind of thing, how do we get an entertainment, uh, was an evolution. And it started actually with the Utah arm, which actually came from MIT. And we built this arm based on some control strategies developed here. 
and it's been a very successful arm. It's an electromyographic arm that you put on your body and it picks up the signals and it's controlled automatically by the flexion of remnant muscles. We, uh, we then did another project with MIT's AI lab called the Utah MIT Dexterous Hand, and this is a hand that has three fingers just like Mickey and a thumb and a master, and this hand will do anything this master tells it to do or that a computer tells it to do. And it was an interesting study, and that got us into building systems under sea. And this is uh, the best teleoperator in the world. This can go to the bottom of the ocean, and this person can stay up safely on the boat and operate this device in such a way that uh, there's interaction with both position and force. So anything this robot under the sea feels, this person perceives as a load on their arm, and you can do very complex manipulation that way. Well, the reason I showed those is that uh, somebody at Disney named Mark Fuller, who now has a little company that makes fountains, saw that, and uh, they were having a lot of trouble with uh, Abraham Lincoln, who you'll see in a second, because his hands kept flying off and he would break and have all sorts of troubles, and they asked us to come and see if we could do something because we made pretty hands, arms, and we made rugged robots, and that's the two properties they wanted. They wanted to have graceful motion, and they also wanted to have uh, very robust operation. So we started into building anthropomorphic robots, and this is sort of like a Disney robot, but this is one that's at Carnegie Science Museum, and it tells kids about science and technology. We have another one we built for Ford that travels around the world uh, talking about Ford cars. Um, so, uh, but before I show a little tape on those robots, uh, one consideration too is when we would do this, people would say, oh, this is crazy. Uh, there's no money in this. Uh, uh, I don't know where it's going. It's too complex and so on. But uh, uh, actually we found out that if you want to be in this field, and if some of you are students or the parents of students, there's some rather startling economics and they're growing rapidly as I guess we have less war and more fun. But I got these numbers, and I won't stand behind any of these numbers. I got it from our marketing group. But numbers for, uh, <laughs> numbers for, uh, for some of these designations, theme parks, five billion, arcades and video games, four billion, family fun centers, four billion. Bowl, we don't do bowling, spectator sports, box office, or live entertainment. But the numbers get to be good enough to, to do something in. Uh, the artificial arm market's not very large, and people say, why did you do that? And we say, because we wanted to. And uh, that's about all you can say. But in entertainment, there's, there, there's uh, money uh, available. If you take a look at themed environments, theme parks, there are major tier one parks, tier two and three parks. There's 200, over 200 two, th uh, tier two parks, and over 1,000 tier three. And of the major theme parks, I think this adds up to 43 or something, but Disney has four. MCA Universal 3, Cedar Fair 4, Paramount 10, Six Flags 10, Bush 11, and Premier 10. And uh, there are other entertainment uh, opportunities going on that are absolutely enormous. If you take a look at Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas, it's now going to be $1.6 billion. Uh, Japan's putting in a place uh, together with Lottie uh, that's $2 billion. And uh, the things that go in them that we get involved with look like this. And this is just the United States right here. But uh, coasters now are running pretty big amounts. If you see a big roller coaster, it's one and a half million dollars. If you see some people movers, 1.2. You see a lot of rides end up being 1.7, strange kinds of rides like water rides and so on. So just in the little attractions that go in parks, there's a, there's a fairly sizable number. So uh, it is a field, is one thing I'd point out. And, uh, and it's growing. Uh, and I don't know why, but people want to go have fun together or they want to be voyeurs or have riskless risk. I think riskless risk is a big thing. People like to get into something that makes it seem like they're at risk, but they're all strapped in. Escapism, dating, distraction, whatever it is, it's growing. And another thing that's happening in the sense we're saying for somebody who works in this field is it's changing. When, when certain of the big companies controlled everything, there was almost no more brutal place you could go as a vendor. Okay, no more, no, no more better place to be, uh, to be abused. But things are changing. The field is growing 15 to 25% a year, and it's actually more than that. Las Vegas hit 30, 30 million guests last year, which is amazing. They have a very small number of people there in comparison. The attraction prices, as I mentioned, are increasing. More parks are built, being built. Just like I said, one little park, $2 billion. A broader client base is weakening central control. 
So now, actually, as a result of that, producers can get a piece of the gate. If you see things like Sky Fun, which is that big arch, and you get on this cable and they pull you up 200 feet and let you go. And uh, not my wife, though. <laughs> not a lot of people. Have anybody seen those in theme parks? And they let you go and you swing? It's pretty amazing. Those are, uh, those are a lot of money, and people pay $25 for the ride. So in addition to getting into the park, you've got to give them $25, and they swing you, and you are adrenaline depleted after that. Uh, I don't know what it does, but it disturbs you a lot. Uh, but he can get a piece of the gate, and actually now it's becoming a technical game, and this is important to say, patents actually work. Before it was just sort of uh, build a little game that you can hit these little gophers and they go down a hole. But if you look at what's happening now, it's getting very technical, and uh, also some people say these markets are less susceptible to recession, but I don't know if that's true. So. Uh, so I thought I'd give you, before I talked again a little bit about uh, Jurassic Park, uh, I'd show you another little tape. It's tape number two, if they're listening in there, that shows an evolution of uh, anthropomorphic robots we built. And uh, let's see if it'll come on. But it's a fun tape. It ends up with uh, one of our robots with Larry King live. Oh, you've got to turn it up. I don't mind, okay. cause you mean that much to me. So this is how they're controlled, or they're controlled automatically, but this is uh, he's really not. The fellow that's controlling him is a mechanical engineer makeup artist, which is a strange combination. He actually did the makeup for uh, Edwin Scissorhands. Now you can see the, the master system can control a virtual image as well as, uh, we did these about four years ago a virtual image as well as uh, a real one. This is the Fort Benning database for uh, SimNet with a wolf oh. in it. So this is uh... now, now this is the first the uh, Disney MGM Studios theme. Fielded robot for Disney. This is the witch. Right there. in Detroit, it opens tomorrow, and as we break, we're going to show you the Ford computer, this robot, Sarkos. Let's go now to yeah, Sarkos. This is Sarkos, the right. robot from the Ford exhibit. May the Ford be with you. May the Ford be with you, yes. And don't forget to listen to Larry King live every day on CNN. Good job, Sarkos. That was good. That was very good. But, you know, I wouldn't give up your day job.
Dennis and talked to the robot, but actually they were talking to a New York stand-up comedian, Tommy Cohen, who uh, has at least 60% of the value here. He's really a great guy, and you'll see him in a second describe how they, uh, how he operates like the system. I would like to take our viewers behind the scenes to find, yes, to see how you actually work, where all these wires go, and how you are managing to look so, excuse the term, human. This is the secret password. I also do stand-up comedy. We are the human animators of the living robot. I have a camera that is fixed into my headpiece, and I can see through there what Sarko sees through his eyes. I also have a television monitor which can show me what's happening in the room, and I also can see through the window here in case I need an overview of the entire room. It's actually a lot of fun. This uh, operator is a very talented uh, individual, and he has become Sarkos the Robot by virtue of this sensor suit. Uh, the helmet obviously uh, uh, is attached to his head, so wherever his head moves, the sensors know it and translate that information to the computers that drive the mechanical Sarkos figure. That's also true for the shoulders, the elbows, the wrists. Each individual finger has a positioning sensor so that it, again, knows and uh, uh, instructs the computer as to what moves are required. Sarkos himself is a very elaborate uh, hydraulic and pneumatic mechanism with other sensors that provide feedback back to the computer so he literally knows where he is at any point in time. I auditioned for this job with many so other turn that off, robots from television and film. Plenty of those are interesting machines. So, uh, so we build a bunch of these uh, machines, and I'll talk a little bit later about where we're maybe going to go with them. Uh, one problem is not anything to do with the technological performance, but its cost. A typical one like the Joe Cocker robot, robot is $250,000 to $400,000, and, uh, and you don't make a lot of money in entertainment doing that kind of thing. These are very, uh, very complicated machines, and they're sort of one-off many times. We built 16 robots for Jurassic Park, which was a ferocious project in terms of pain and suffering. It was really deep fun. And, uh, but they were mostly all different. And, uh, and just for uh, uh, the review of that whole thing, the things you have to do, the size of them range from the size of a chicken, the little compies, if you remember the movie, up to 80,000 pounds for the T-Rex. And I'll show you some more about that. We built 16 systems plus all sorts of support equipment. They ha they're not like movie machines which can, uh, but we can never build a spider. Uh, anyway, they're not like movie machines where you can just make it run a couple of times and take 15 shots and then pick the one you want. They have to wake up each morning and they have to run essentially 365 days a year, 16 hours a day, on and on and on with uh, silicone skins and so on. So it's a, grueling, uh, it's a grueling environment. Water, chemicals, heat, steam, plants, and on skin exposure, UV, direct sunlight, water, chemicals, mechanical flexing, and so on. It's about the worst environment you could imagine. And we were supposed to have only three robots that were in water. And water, by the way, for anybody who doesn't design machinery, is the worst thing on Earth. I mean, it's, it's caused disasters in our place four times. Distinct, horrible disasters, because we underestimated that water can get into everything and then destroy it. And, uh, and so having the skins in the machines now and bathed in water is a very tough situation. I guess the guys from the Navy know that because they're always painting things. But uh, the movements had to be fast, graceful, and impedance controlled. The person who did, uh, who did the programming for that T-Rex, and that's not the best program, but that's the only one I could get, is a guy named Davey Fighton, who was famous at Disney. And he programmed Joe Cocker, and he also programmed Buzz Lightyear, uh, Buzz Lightyear for the movie Toy Story. So he's got a very beautiful sense of uh, the way things move. And uh, he did a lot of the robots there. So you have to, in addition to doing the technology, you have to get an artist who can see the way things move very well. And, uh, and it's a demanding design from the standpoint that uh, everything had to be approved uh, back and forth up the chain from Steven Spielberg back down to the lowest person, back up to Steven Spielberg. And the reason we did a lot of the sensor suit work that you saw the little suit to run the, the wolf was actually during the project in the beginning, the suit drove every dinosaur that we had and they did lightly rendered systems and would do choreography. The artists from Universal would come up and do choreography on the robot and then it would go to Spielberg and his crew to see if they liked it and go back and forth. 
because the hardest thing in the beginning was getting a consensus in the minds of two different kinds of minds, which were the technical people and engineers and the artists. You know, the artists would say, I want a really big, mean robot. And that doesn't mean that the engineers knew what they were talking about. Uh, and I'll show you what we did to try to solve that. The other thing that made the project tough were things like system complexity, uh, the kind of movements and coverings and so on, many moving parts. I had this one thing, when you see some of these inside, you'll see they have enormous steel parts. And it was because they had this arbitrary rule we could never pass, was that we could only use steel and we could only go to 5,000 PSI in any weldment. And so things got big. Uh, there's a lot of surrounding structures and conduits, safety of guests and staff. The time and budget was short and thin. The, the sponsor, we had 20 different management interfaces with the company in two years. And then, uh, so again, it was, it was sort of deep fun. So the way we started out was generating wireframe models of all of these systems into which we put skeletons with these little red actuators because we decided we were never going to get anywhere with the customer unless they could shop. Everybody likes to shop around would say, this robot's going to cost a million dollars. They go, what? You know, and you couldn't do anything but argue with them until you could say, OK, here's a tail. And this tail has one, two, three degrees of freedom. And so it goes like this. And they say, well, we want a really slinky serpentine tail. So you build a model with eight actuators, and it would go just like a snake. And then would tell them that that was 80% more. They oh, we don't want that. So we'd go back and forth and back and forth. And we could make all the changes in the virtual world and what we were doing that was really interesting from an engineering standpoint was generating a database that everybody agreed with. We then took these databases apart, and the shapes went to the sculptors, and structures to structures people, and the actuators went to the actuator people for simulation and so on. These are all hydraulic, but that's what you need for the kinds of systems we do. We'd much rather have had them be done with electricity. But uh, So here's one of those pictures of uh, Klaus with, uh, with a lightly rendered spitter. And uh, it starts with foam uh, sculpts. I thought I had a maquette. Well, it starts with little maquettes about this tall that everybody buys off on. They could be done virtually, but they're not. And then you start sculpting foam. This is a guy named Clay Furches, which matches what he does. And this is the T-Rex being started out of urethane foam. We're trying to get to the point where we can digitally machine those, but we can't right now. And then here he is. He's very committed to his work. He's doing in the work in the mouth. <laughs> But our, uh, our joke I was telling Woody is that this is our lawyer. And, uh, <laughs> but what nobody understands is he's attacking the dinosaur. He's got him by the epic wallet, right? So anyway. So and here's our sculpting team. This was the group that was interesting to watch together with the engineers. And, and he wouldn't fit in our building, so we had to take his drumsticks off. And, uh, and we did that and then started building real systems. And uh, this is him, pieces of fiberglass, silicone, and uh, so on. And, uh, and then he was shipped to go together with this whole system, which looks like this. So you saw him come out of the waterfall. Well, this big structure holds him back under the waterfall, and then he swings out. This is the waterfall generator. And to give you a perspective about this, this is really more like construction equipment, because there's what a person's like. And that's about where you are when you go over the falls. Because see, right, I don't know if you noticed it, but right as he attacks you, then you tip over and you go eight stories down and come out the bottom uh, going lickety split. And again, uh, all of this was done with actually Pro Engineer. Uh, and you can see the actuation systems and so on that hold the, that hold the, uh, the dinosaur. And to, just to show you one thing I think that's interesting about the size is you can design things on a, on a screen like this and just think, well, it's just a part. And you see this little triangle right here. Well, that little part looks like this when they deliver it. And so you can see the little pins that are used to put it together and the little studs where some of the linkages hook on. So we actually looked around and we had to get the biggest crane that existed in California to put pieces of him up on the top of this 80 foot, well, actually 120 foot. Uh, tower. And, uh, and we, of course, uh, analyzed everything for, uh, for our little guideline to not go above 5,000 PSI. And uh, none of us ever liked that. So, uh, so let me just make a few other comments. Uh, 
some conclusions. Um, we get a lot of technical people that come into the entertainment group and they don't quite understand, so I told them what somebody told me, you gotta remember that it's the story that counts, right? And uh, people come in and they just wanna have a great story and if you, if you have somebody that doesn't know how to do it run the robot that was there with Ford, it falls flat just like any entertainment issue. But if you have, uh, but if you have an entertainer like Tommy run it, then it does better probably than him alone. And it's interesting because the robot is less threatening uh, we found various people, I'd go ask them in the audience at the Ford Pavilion or the Ford booth at the auto show why they liked it, and it was surprising how many comments came up that there was, you could trust it. I mean, somehow they trusted the robot. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'd keep digging into it, but there were feelings like that. And that there's other funny things about dinosaurs, like I've been trying to figure out for years, why did children like dinosaurs? And I decided they like dinosaurs for the same reason I like a guy who's six foot six and weighs 300 pounds with tattoos all over and pulls up on a Harley and says, who are you? And I want to make friends. <laughs> and, uh, so you want to make friends with things like that. But at any rate, uh, technology can be the discriminator and it can help you have a monopoly, expanded capability and fun, but it's just not sufficient. And when people come in engineering school, you gotta to talk to them about that, that it's actually true with a car too. It's the story that counts. It's the car the person gets to drive, not the fact that it has better springs. It's also a team sport. It requires a mixed uh, set of broad capabilities from artistic, creative engineering to business. And it's rough and tough and you better believe it. Uh, I'm telling you, I think if you, if you look at the kind of people that run these industries, they're movie people and they're gamblers. They go, seven and they bet $200 million at a whack with a movie, and they run it hor with horrible schedules. I really uh, feel bad for them. It's really a tough life. Now you put them together with a bunch of guys like our sculptors who sit back and say, this is going to be the most beautiful piece in the world, and the clock starts going and the money starts running and pretty soon the sparks come. So it's a fairly, uh, it's a fairly tough environment. Another little comment about technology, since we're talking about technology and fun, it's really confusing what matters, uh, flash in the technology may not mean true business value. And uh, there's other things that dominate too, like cost and safety. And so, uh, so one thing I tell people that are gonna go into this area, you know, you gotta think about it, there's some really better areas. If you build catheters for brains and you look at the market size or pumps for drugs, like for genetically engineered drugs, they talk uh, in some market surveys, I don't know if I believe them, but by the year 2010, the worldwide market for genetically engineered drugs uh, or their application is $400 billion a year with a third of every doctor's visit involving the administration or use of something related to genetic engineering. And, um, and the patent protection's better and so on, but, uh, but in the end, you get to choose what you do. And uh, the reason we keep doing this is there's this kind of fun aspect or satisfaction aspect in doing it. And, uh, so anyway, comments on the future, where these things are going. You see the robots we have there, and you see some interactive devices I didn't show you. We've got mobility interfaces you can get on and run around inside of virtual worlds. We have uh, these little shooter systems that are infrared two-way communicators, digital communicators, but I don't dare show them on the East Coast because they're shaped like guns. And uh, it's in Utah, or in Montana, my, uh, my boy went to school at Montana State, and as we checked him in, at the front desk there was a, a Xerox, sheet hung there that said, all students, check your guns in at the front counter. <laughs> this is two years ago, and I thought back to MIT, <laughs> something different. But at any rate, uh, we make little shooters that you can, you can point and designate complicated commands to, and if you, if you really think about where things are going, they're going with displays, interfaces, computation, and communication. In other words, how to take a person into the environment. In the little system we did, well, I'll show it to you, at Buffalo Bills, it's a, it's a flume ride. We, uh, we made these. Now this is the shape they wanted because it's a six gun western place. And this, uh, this little gun does an infrared communication with targets and so it turned their ride into sort of a shooting gallery. And, uh, and so there's all sorts of things going on with computers and so on but in the end that's kind of fun because you go through. And what's really interesting is some of the uh, bad guys that are there shoot you back. The kids really like it because they'll shoot one of the bad guys and he comes up and squirts him with a squirt gun in the face. So uh, there's gonna be more and more interaction 
in all of these areas. And so a lot of the things that go along with computers are going to help in the area. A lot of mixed environments and, uh, and also needs for rapidly changeable attractions. You can no longer in that business get a Ferris wheel and let it sit there and sit there without adding new attractions. I think most theme parks try to have a major attraction added every year and a minor one in between years. And technology can help with making variable attractions, especially if you do things with, with a virtual environment. If the displays get better, you can have more changeability. Also, the possibility of mobile systems that can, can move around. What you'd really like to do is permit the use of more expensive capital assets in smaller attractions, but not have them go stale. If you go to a smaller attraction, uh, and then you go back there two or three times. I don't know how many people do that here, but your kids probably do. If the same stuff's there, then you don't go back. And also, another area that's going to expand a lot is personal ownership uh, by the guests. So they own the system that they use and, uh, and can take it home with them or bring it back. In the case of these, uh, we're going to do a thing with something like this. It won't look like a gun anymore. It'll be a personal communicator for the Ford Pavilion. Uh, we're going to also do some of these in casinos. So when you check in, you get this little box, and the little box is yours. And you can download money into it, which isn't new, but it's been new. It'd be new in this environment. And you can use it to open your room and uh, play Keno and uh, gamble, or order your car up from the, uh, from the valet, and the system will have all the information in it relative to you and be cheap enough for you to own yourself. So at any rate, that's sort of a a look, of, uh, look at the fun side of, uh, of what we do. Uh, are there any questions? Because we have three minutes, <laughs> I think. I was going to. Well, then I guess I'm supposed to introduce uh, Seymour Papert, and then I'll vacate the stage here. Thank you. Well, I see you can get away from technology. I'm not going to show you any pictures, because it's obviously impossible to outdo what you've just seen. Uh, also, maybe I'm going to be rather more serious than I usually am and the other speakers, because usually when I talk about uh, technology, I try to say it's for fun. It's for a special kind of fun for children special kind of fun called hard fun. And uh, so I, usually people don't think of technology like that, and so I try to inject the fun. But I think this time I'd like to inject the serious side and suggest that we are really not taking our children and the technologies that they can use as seriously as we ought to. And by we, I mean all of you. Uh, I certainly mean our society and people who think about what I'd like to call the learning environment. And oh, uh, you see, uh, we are slaves to technology. I was asked to move into a place that's more convenient for that camera, but it doesn't seem to be working any better anyway. Uh, OK, so I'd like to start by giving a couple of, uh, of little anecdotes that I like to tell. Anecdote one, uh, you see your grandchild, age three, walk up to a shelf, pick out a videotape, and go and put it in the VCR, uh, press on some buttons, say, some expletive deleted, which means he forgot to rewind it. He rewinds it fluently without hesitating a moment and spends the next half hour immersed in whatever it is, dinosaurs or road construction machines or whatever it might be. And 
I'd like to reflect a little about the significance of that kind of incident. People often say, well, isn't that amazing that a three-year-old can do all that, can work that technology? And when it's a two-year-old and he's clicking on a mouse and making a, a, a computer program play, they even more inclined to say, gee, wow. But in fact, if you think of the complexity of what that kid is doing, either of those kids, it's nothing compared with what they do all the time, just knowing where their toys are kept, how to get them out of that closet, how to put them away at the end, unlikely, but they know how to do it if they wanted to. <laughs> uh, what we see them doing with these computers and VCRs is very simple compared with that. So that's not the side of it that's, that's impressive. What really is impressive is, uh, well, for me and for anybody even half my age, I think, when I was three years old, there was no way in which I could decide to spend the next half hour immersed in dinosaurs or road construction machines or anything that might have interested me. I could explore everything within reach and touch inside the place where I lived, but anything beyond that, I was totally dependent on adults. I mean, I could ask them about dinosaurs, and they might be able to tell me, and they might be willing to tell me, but it's not the same experience anyway. And I think that this is a little pointer to a deep, deep transformation that is taking place in the relationship between children, knowledge, adults, family, society. And it needs to be taken very seriously. There's a lot of talk in the papers and when people get on to talking about the World Wide Web and the Internet, about the danger, pornography, predators, there are obvious dangers. People are scared of letting their kids loose on this in the cyber world. And there's reason for a lot of those fears, but I'd like to suggest that they miss the point. That people worried about pornography on the Internet, this is just symbolic. They really worried about something much deeper that they maybe haven't articulated. And that deeper thing is questions of dependence and independence and the amount of control they have or want to have over their kids and the control that the kids have or want to have or the parents want them to have over the world and life. Kids are getting access to vastly greater and different kinds of dependence and independence. And this is something that, you know, I think is going far enough already to make it irresponsible for people not to be thinking very hard about rethinking what parenting is about, what the family is about, what being a child is about, what we expect from children. That the children can wander off and might run into a picture of a naked person, or worse, is really part of this larger question that children are less dependent on their adults and becoming less and less so, and what is the implication of that? Nobody really knows. And I don't think they're just talking about it's going to solve the problem, but at least it's a step. I'd like to look at this from a slightly sort of more uh, academic point of view, general, generalized point of view, by s outlining a, a different kind of theory of stages in individual development in relation to knowledge and learning. Stage one, baby's born, and from day one, if not before, that baby begins an active process of exploration. First, its own body, its mother's body, it begins to crawl, it explores the world. And all this is producing an incredible lot of learning. That baby is learning very thoroughly a very limited world, that immediate reality. But it's learning it in a particular way, note. This particular way is 
by exploration through experience, driven from inner desire. Everything that's done is meaningful to that child. That's stage one. Stage two begins when the child sees a dinosaur and says, well, how did dinosaurs eat? Or what, what happened to them? Or whatever question might be asked about the dinosaur. This child has run into, inside the little immediate world, has run into questions about the bigger world out there. And the child has no way to answer those questions except, well, fantasy that can go freely, and that's wonderful, but is not related, not rooted in, uh, in reality. Or asking adults, or accidentally, it so happens that there's a piece on television, or uh, the mother happens to read a book, or, uh, but on the whole, the child is helpless in getting that knowledge. And so we gradually get a shift in the mode of learning from experiential to verbal, because if you're going to ask and get answers, it's all in words. And bit by bit, it moves away from your agenda to somebody else's agenda. And the, the ultimate of that is school, where it's entirely somebody else's agenda. There's the curriculum, and that's what you learn, and somebody else is going to decide. Here are the textbooks, and, and there's all this set out knowledge. Somebody's decided that that's what you should know. And so you go to school, and you go through the traumatic experience of, well, I'm going to say this outrageous thing, but I really mean it, giving up learning and adapting to being taught. And being taught is not the same as learning. Well, you go through school, and it's a precarious little journey. It's more precarious than anybody in this room is likely to know, because you wouldn't be in this room if you weren't one of those who survived the journey. <laughs> most people don't. And most people in the course of this journey have that drive to learn, curiosity, explore, to know, to be independent, that babies are all born with, they have it attenuated and it's gone, and, and that's uh, just a fact. Now, those who survive get something wonderful out of school, namely, they get new ways of access to independence. You learn to read. You learn to not just read the letters, to, to use encyclopedias and libraries and conversations and all the rest of the means of access to knowledge. And eventually, you get to a place where you go back to stage one, and that's stage three. Because the closest, uh, the closest thing I know to the stage one child in those first couple of years is the best work by graduate students in or the best work in a research lab, or the best and most creative work in you know, making Jurassic Park, or creating a business, or independent people really being creative, following their own ideas, learning what they need to know when they need to know it, knowing from experience. And so I think we really do, in an important sense, go back to stage three. Um, in stage three, go back to stage one. Well, what my story about the videotape is really pointing to is that technology is getting to a place where it can bypass stage two. Because we're getting to a place where there need not be that discontinuity, where reading books, encyclopedias in printed, written form, no longer are the major and only form of access to, to a broader knowledge and a broader world. And the videotape is just a hint at what is already coming and what's around the corner, that uh, with more and more of them, with video on demand, with the World Wide Web, with just the beginnings of of search engines that are not formulated, in, that, that don't require uh, 
you know, they're not text-based, and their categories are not the categories that interest an adult. We are beginning to see organizations, uh, people trying to make interfaces accessible to preschool children, independently of, of reading and writing, so that they are now just about beginning to get across the threshold of access to knowledge, and ultimately, better knowledge, more detailed knowledge, easier access knowledge than can be found in printed books for all the reasons that make the electronic interactive media more effective. This is not just in its projection a supplement to reading and writing or just another medium, it is a vastly superior medium. Of course, that will subsume reading and writing, then it will always include text in the foreseeable future anyway, but it will no longer be true that so-called literacy, that I'd rather call literacy, is the essential uh, road towards being able to get more knowledge. I think that the we ought, to even, we ought to question very seriously, and we will be sort of forced to question more seriously, the importance that we give in our school years to those so-called three R's, I mean, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, well, I think reading is going to be important for a long time, but I would foresee that it will stop having that primordial importance that it's had. I don't think kids will give up reading. As a matter of fact, my prediction is that if we stop trying to make kids read, they would learn to read much more. Because I think a lot of the problems that kids have about reading is that parents and teachers get so upset when this kid is not reading on time, according to some timetable that's been set by somebody else, that they the, they develop these tensions and they're worried and the kid senses all this and there's a whole psychological uh, cascade of, 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 of events that frustrate good, free, relaxed learning and so we self-generate. This remarkable epidemic that has invaded the world that just didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago called learning disabilities, dyslexia and all the rest of it that um, well, so when we look at the way that our education world is thinking about technology in relation to learning, it's, to my mind, shockingly different from the implications of the picture I've been trying to give you. I'm not talking about what you'll see in schools all over the place where somehow the idea that we will use these computers to improve a little bit or a lot the same kind of teaching of the same kind of material on roughly the same sort of, of time scale. Uh, well, that's the way in which all technologies first enter the world. And, uh, you know, Jurassic Park we just looked at. And, the first use of a movie camera wasn't anything like that. The first movie was, well, you had this wonderful camera. You said, well, this is technology-aided theater. So act a play and put the camera in front of it and make the first movie. So you're using it to improve, to make a slightly better version of something that you've been doing all along. And that's about where we're at in our uses of of computers in, in schools. Uh, at least they're not harmful. Where I think they are harmful, where that idea of how to use computers is very harmful, is in what's happening to children whose families own computers and who buy the so-called education software that's flooding the market. And this is why I think it's actually harmful. Because I see that transition from stage one to stage two. In the past, it's been a um, you know, necessary evil, let's say, a necessary price to pay, because we had no way in which 
children could continue the kind of learning that happens before school, let's call it home-style learning or natural learning, we had no way in which that learning could encompass all the knowledge we thought children ought to have, and correctly thought that. So we instituted something else called school-style learning. And that was a necessary evil. And it's an extremely dangerous thing. And it's, it's, it's an inferior kind of learning, as evidenced by the fact that none of you, if you need to know something, go and take a course in it. You read the newspaper, you read the, you, you read the financial reports if you want to make a, an investment. You don't submit yourself to somebody else's curriculum in a school. Um, so why do we put children to it? Because we didn't have any choice. But now a new thing is happening, and that is uh, most parents, certainly most educated parents now have computers at home, and a new kind of question is coming up for them. Previously, it was a division of labor that children, you know, they did certain kinds of things they learned at home. They learned to talk, they learned to walk, to find their way around space, get around the house, get around the parents, for that matter, <laughs> learn to be psychologically manipulative and get some insight into psycho all this stuff they learned at home. On the other hand, stuff like what we call math at school, I just can't bring myself to call it mathematics, uh, this stuff was the job of teachers and schools. Parents never bothered much about it, except when they got a bad report card and they had a conference with the teacher. Now, all of a sudden, parents are being flooded with, uh, with ad advertising saying, buy this, 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 this CD-ROM, it will teach your child, it will be such fun, she won't even know that she's learning, she won't even know she's doing math. Uh, and there's several aspects of that that I think are bad. One of them is that parents are being asked to make decisions about issues that they haven't thought, any, they haven't thought about. And they're not qualified to make. Although that's the less important. If they would really throw off their prejudices and, and just think they would do much better. But what in fact they are doing is succumbing to the marketing device that you will sell best a software that has these characteristics. It must look like school because in many people's minds, school is the safest way to think about what's good learning. It will serve a babysitter function by keeping the kid focused there without your having to bother about, you know, without bothering you. And uh, it should be well, it comes the same thing again. It should be just run independently. The kid shouldn't have to ask many questions. It shouldn't plant too many bad ideas in the child's mind either. So you buy the stuff. It's the best-selling software. And what you're doing is importing into the home, those early years, the kinds of learning and the habits of learning that previously belonged to the school years. And nobody knows how bad a thing that is. I suspect it's a very bad thing, and I'd like to emphasize that by telling another story about a grandchild. Uh, a little while ago, I went, I spent a day in the school of my then six and a half year old grandchild, and I, I sort of hung out in the school. I didn't sit next to him, or, but I kept an eye on what he was doing. Two things that struck me I've seen often, maybe I should have said earlier, I do a lot of, for the last uh, uh, quite a number of years, I've been increasingly spending my time thinking about what computers can mean for children. I've done a lot of work in schools and done projects in them and hung around in schools a lot. So it's not a new experience for me to go into a school, but I hadn't done it for a while, and it was a new experience for me to go into a school thinking about one individual child whom I knew very, very well. And the two things that struck me were these. First of all, it looked like a different person. This kid I know as an intellectually intense, highly energetic, 
vibrantly energetic person who gets passionately interested in things and you can't take him away from the things he's doing and he wants to do. Computers, yes. Video games, yes, but growing vegetables he was fascinated by for a while. He's involved in cooking, he's involved in some very big projects and building out of Lego. Uh, high quality stuff, self-directed. I go into school and I see, the first thing that strikes me is that this level of intensity, instead of being up there, is down there somewhere. It's a kind of... Uh, Low, laid back, not much is happening. Most of the time they're sitting around or when they're paying attention, they're sort of paying attention. They are little bursts, bursts of energy. There's a good teacher who sometimes sort of turns them on for a while, but taken over the whole day, I would say that in terms of energy level, it's about 10% of what I see this kid. And that bothers me and I think it's characteristic of the nature of school and the nature of that shift we're making in kinds of learning. And then the other thing that bothered me was uh, related, but I think a different thing, and that was a corruption of values. And I think school in its nature is deeply corrupting in values. And in this one, the, the, the example of that that particularly struck me was intellectual honesty and goals, that this kid at home and before going to school would do things because he thought they were important and had a real personal commitment to doing them and would defend it, sometimes much to the, you know, causing a lot of trouble for his parents. And now in school, instead of doing things that were uh, came from his heart and came from deep commitment that he believed in, he was doing things because he got a check mark in a book or a star or a teacher approved of it. So he's being shifted from acting out of conviction to acting out of getting external approval. I can't imagine any worse moral corruption than that. And it's intrinsic in our school system. Some schools worse than others, but it's not that. I mean, some teachers manage to overcome this entirely. I'm not talking about that. Wonderful things happen in some classrooms by some teachers, but if you think about the nature of that system as a whole, these are qualities of that system. Well, how could it be different? Uh, how can technology make it different? I've mentioned one way in which uh, access to computers and the web and things like that make a difference. And I want to mention another which I think is inc just as important, maybe more important, or the two that I'm going to mention are they get their importance by being put together. And the one that I've mentioned already is the, what's become the popular kind of synonym for what computer stuff and the network and all this is about, it's information. It's information technology, we even call it. Well, that's a wrong approach, I think, because of what I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, in 1967, I first came to MIT, and before coming here, I'd had a lot of contact with, with Jean Piaget, a great child psychologist in, in Switzerland. Oh, I was a mathematician. Um, when I came to MIT, I'd, I'd played with computers a little. This was in 1964. I'd played with a few computers in Europe and had a few little contact with them. Came to MIT and I was waiting for, on the first, I, I was waiting for Marvin Minsky to turn up late for a, an appointment, and there he was, next to his office was a computer. In fact, it was the first model of digital equipment's uh, um, PDP-1, or maybe it was, no, it was number two, or so, very, very early, early uh, prototype. And it was sitting there, so I just started fiddling with it, and I fiddled with it for about an hour, and when Minsky came in, I sort of apologized. I'd said I'd been playing with his computer, but 
he looked at me in amazement and said, well, of course, that's what it's there for. <laughs> and this idea that you could just take this computer and just fool with it uh, was totally alien to me. And it, for a long time, it was going to become alien to most people's ideas of computers. But of course, now we have personal computers, and that's the standard model. Playing with that computer, I suddenly found out that I could take some problems that had been bothering me for years, and with this computer, I could get a whole new insight. And in a few days, I cleaned up a whole bunch of problems that I had been on my, my agenda. And, and this was a revelatory experience. And in fact, that's what caused me to decide to come to MIT. There was that what I referred to as a short two-week visit. And then because of this, I accepted a two-year invitation. And that turned into the rest of my life. I'm still here. Uh, but this revelation planted a little seed in my mind that I'd been worrying for years before that about how can the learning of children change. And all of a sudden, there it was. It seemed that here is the way. If children could only have that enormous amplification of power, that exhilarating experience of intellectual empowerment that I had, just getting at that, what I see now as an incredibly primitive computer, if children could only get at that, that could change their patterns of intellectual development. And that became a little obsession of mine. And right through the 60s and 70s, when the idea of children actually getting at a computer except in specially artificial setups, some of which we were responsible for, seemed very uh, remote. And uh, I was accused by, when I wrote proposals to try and get funds to support it, of they ranged from romantic to elitist. I mean, maybe a few millionaires' children will, will be able to benefit from this, but it won't change the world. Well, it has changed the world. and. Uh, in all that time, it's now 30 years, a main thrust of our work in, that was in the artificial intelligence lab. And then when the media lab got founded, I was one of the original group in finding the, the media lab. And we moved, transferred our activities into there and continued until now. And the thrust of our work is not the computer as an information source nor the computer as a kind of automated teacher that treats the child as a kind of answering machine. You know, what's 7 plus 8? You're right, you're wrong. Next question, next answer. We like to think of the computer as a medium of construction. We saw those pictures on, uh, uh, of, of Duray. We saw pictures of robots. We have children making. They're not as elaborate as that. We're beginning to have children being able to make that kind of robot in a simplified form. We have children programming the computer, making their own video games, if that's what they're interested in. That is, they're taking this technology and using it as a constructive medium to carry out projects that are not any more complex than children have ever been able to do in the past, except on the psychological plane of learning to maybe be part of a family. But in terms of, of handling matter and projects with a technical, scientific, mathematical content, until recently, there was very little that a child could do that had serious content of that sort that could be carried out as a long-term project. So that you can get the feel of what it's like to make something really complex work and run into the bugs and difficulties that we you know, saw a sample of in how to deal with and how to construct these uh, Jurassic Park robots. In doing this, we've worked with companies. We've worked especially with the Lego, makers of Lego. And one of the thrusts of our work with Lego has been developing a tiny little computer which you could put inside a Lego model and senses so this computer could know about the environment, could detect light, sound, touch, heat. And so you could make a 
out of Lego extended in this way, you could make a real robot that would really do something under its own control with its little brain inside it. And that's been a long, long haul, and I believe that early next year or late this year, they're actually going to put one of these devices on the market. But in the last uh, 15 years, we've been working with children with prototypes of this, and we've actually got some fancier ones that are much smaller. And it's quite amazing what children could do. But as examples of the kind of thing that you know, uh, I worked one summer with two girls, one about six to seven and the other about eight, and we worked together on several afternoons a week for several weeks in the summer. Uh, what they wanted to make was a cat and a kitten out of Lego, and they sort of dressed them up, they made whiskers, but also inside the cat and the kitten was real behavior. They were not only constructing structures, they were actually constructing behavior. And the behavior they wanted was when the kitten squeaked, the cat would come to it. Well, how do you do that? Uh, engineers know how to do that. Hardly anybody in our society who hasn't been through engineering school knows how to do that, but six-year-olds can know how to do that. And they can understand ideas of how to use sensors, how to use the idea of feedback, how to control a process, how to do all sorts of stuff that we teach in college-level engineering courses on control engineering. They can do it, and this kind of stuff is more accessible and easier to learn than the dead language kind of mathematics we try to teach them in school. And it includes it, because in the course of working on making these devices, they run into fractions and decimals and shapes and uh, configurations and all the things that are normally treated like a dead language. In the school math and science classes, they learn like a living language, like living in the country. So they learn math like living in math land, which is the place which is to mathematics like France is to French, where you live by, learn the language by speaking it, not by being taught it in a classroom. And we see in this a transformation of the kind of play activities that children can do. But now I'd like to say something about play. When I looked into that school, what struck me even when there was activity that the teachers called play, I didn't call that play, it was play play. It was play play play. It wasn't even real play. Because real play is the intensity that my little grandson had when he was really engaged. Real play is the intensity that my graduate students have when they're really immersed in a project and are playing with ideas and are trying to explore and decide how to do something, getting really excited. This is the kind of play that we usually call work. And that's why I, mean, I used, I think, this title that I tried to give this talk of play as child's work uh, is, uh, I think it points to a degree of seriousness about serious play. And serious play isn't making the child a sort of uh, kind of too serious person who doesn't know how to laugh and fool around. On the contrary, it's full of laughing and fooling around, just like the best work is. So I think these two things come together. The way, an example of how they might come together is an, a graduate student working under my direction now, Mich uh, Michelle Evard, is doing it a project that's a prime example of how these two sides of the information process come together. She's working in an inner city uh, high school, uh, elementary school in, in Boston, where for a number of years we've had computers that, uh, enough computers so that kids can have, say, an hour or two a day working at the computers. And they do all sorts of things with them, but one kind of project that we've tried to foster there is a project where for a whole year, for that hour a day, say, 
you will be working on a project. So you get the feel of what it's like to pursue a project over a long enough period of time for it to inhabit you so that when you wake up in the morning, you get an idea for it. So that you've got enough time to try something out, find it's wrong, and then try something else. Uh, the kind of project that, we've done many kinds of projects, some of them involving this Lego. This particular uh, research uh, investigation of Michelle Evards is about one that I mentioned before, making your own video game. The kids are gonna make a game and together with the game, they're going to make the advertising material with it, the instruction book for how to use it. They're going to present it at the end of the year as a kind of game fair where they and other kids and parents and anyone who wants to come will come and they'll each try to sell their particular, particular game. Well, one of the problems about that way of learning is Access. Where does information come from? And how do you get an answer to a question? There you are. You're trying to make something move in a, you know, make a, a figure jump. And you think, well, what's a jump? What's it look like? And how do you describe it? And uh, well, you say teacher, teacher, but the teacher's only got limited knowledge and only limited time. What Michelle Evard's project is about is breaking down this incredible inefficiency of having one teacher to 30 learners or 20 learners. It's crazy. Why don't we have 30 teachers and 30 learners? Well, this is a move in that direction. That If you stuck with this problem, you might ask the kid next to you, you might ask the teacher, but if you don't get something immediate or you do, there's another route that you might prefer anyway. She's constructed a kind of uh, you know, net system. You throw your question into cyberspace, so you put it in the computer. And then there's a community of people that might include kids who did this the year before. Or it might include a kid at the other end of the class you've never spoken to. Or somebody outside altogether, but you throw your problem out and then we see that there are a lot of kids who really enjoy acting as consultants and picking up other people's problems and thinking about them and drawing on their own experience. And we've noticed through this getting, uh, getting a, uh, this access to being able to consult with this larger community, a very marked improvement in the quality of, of, what, of the work these kids can do. So, we see then putting the two things together. Uh, this is a kind of net information access, person access kind of function with having a real hard technical kind of project to work on. Put them together and the kind of mindless surfing of the web that you often get gets replaced by a purposeful search for information that you need for a project you really engaged in. And both come up and we're beginning to see a kind of chemical reaction there that I think is a little model of what the alternative to so-called curriculum-based environment, curriculum-based based learning will be. And I think that curriculum-based learning is going to disappear. Uh, certainly, what I'm sure will disappear is this perverse idea that we should segregate people by ages and levels of knowledge. Yeah, it's amazing how we take it for granted that it's natural that you should be first grade, all these kids together, second grade, all these kids together. Why? I mean, if I told you to segregate yourself, and I won't talk to you unless everybody between 20 and 25 sits there, but 20, uh, you'd think I was crazy and you wouldn't do it. Why do we do this in school? Now, there's only one reason, and that is that in the past, the only way we had of getting this knowledge out was systematizing it and spoon feeding it in a kind of industrial production. So what we're seeing there is a production line, old industrial style production line. And there's no other justification for it. In, people say, if you ask them, well, it's for socialization. Gosh, well, uh, it sounds to me like what happens is, even you seven, you spend your whole seventh year learning how to deal with kids of age seven, 
And then in typical school fashion, you never deal with, a, with that again, having learned it. You get on to the next thing. And you never see a seven-year-old again, because now you've got to learn to deal with eight-year-olds. What, what this deprives you of is that mixture of skills and levels of understanding where people can be in a real learning community where people who know a lot and people who know a little are all together, and each side learns and expands their knowledge by exchanging, exchanging with the others. And you know, everywhere, that's the better thing to do. It's not only in this meeting and your lives. It's uh, in these great old extended families that we so deplore the, 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 the disappearance of. In one place, there'd be parents, children, grandparents, all together, living together, and we thought it was wonderful that these communities existed, and we deplore the fact they disappeared, but they weren't segregated by age. Everybody got richer lives and richer learning because they were all together. And I think the perversion of, I want to recognize a perver, well, it's not a perversion. It's only a perversion if you think that that's the natural thing to do. I want to recognize the whole structure of school, the idea of grades, the idea of curriculum, is a way of dealing with a now obsolete or rapidly becoming obsolescent kind of relationship with knowledge and its dissemination. And all that should go. So technology in education doesn't mean using it to improve the system. And it's very hard to get this through people's heads. I mean, I give talks like this to meetings of superintendents of schools, and at the end somebody says, but tell me concretely, how do you think in the year 2020 we will teach, use computers to teach the fourth grade math curriculum? And you want to tear your head out. There won't be any fourth grade. We won't be teaching. We'll be learning. There won't be a separate subject called math. It'll be part of... Uh, but these categories are so deeply ingrained in us, we need a serious struggle to break out. And that's something you can all do and make a big difference in the world by fighting these categories and just calling them in question. And maybe you don't even say they're wrong. You have to say, well, think about it. Have you thought about whether they could be gotten away with? Well, some schools, well, uh, I'm going to use the rest of my time on that word, world. And it's impossible to talk about things like this, about the role of technology and expensive machinery without facing the fact that the world doesn't consist of economically homogeneous people, that there are about 20, 20 countries in the world in which I would say there's a process afoot that's bringing computers and connectivity into the lives of most children. They don't all get it, and we're very far from it in the United States, and we should be thoroughly ashamed of ourselves that our president can stand up and, and suggest that putting one computer in each school or in each classroom is a worthy objective for our country. I mean, a computer on every desk and another one in every home for every child would be maybe a little better and we could afford it. But anyway, past that, there are 180 other countries in the world where the chance of children getting access to any of this is extremely slim unless something is done. And so a few of us have started a foundation which we call 2B1. Does that technology work? Oh. You can look on its website, www. 2b1.org. The goal of this foundation is to bring, promote every way we can find of bringing access to computers and connectivity to those parts of the world where, for reasons of geographic isolation, poverty, political opposition, whatever the reason, where there are obstacles. And the first action of this, uh, of this foundation is going to happen this July when we're going to try to bring together right here, well, not in this room, but in this campus, we try, we're trying to round up at the moment 
a hundred activists from developing countries. And by activists, we mean people who out there, against all odds, have done something bringing computers to kids where it seemed very unlikely that they would get them. And the more what they did is mission impossible, the more we like them and we're trying to cast out a net and get a hundred such people, invite them in here. And we would have a six-day brainstorming workshop where the hundred activists, together with a hundred other people who are who come along with technological knowledge, with experience in organizing, with ideas about learning, with ideas about funding, with other resources, can come together in a mix from which we would like to generate new ideas, spreading the ideas that already exist. The beginnings of a community formation of trying to move this extension of move this wonderful thing we call sub, you know, digital technology out of the range of the elite, elite countries and elite people within countries to that wider world. And we sort of feel, romantic as it might sound, that children come into the world without sense of hatred, isolation, and that they want to preserve the environment and they like the world they live in. And if we can get children into a new kind of internationalism through knowing more about the world, through connectivity and knowing more about ways of knowledge that have been our, uh, our, our privilege, uh, this might make a better world. And so the name 2B1, uh, you can read it all sorts of ways you like, and, but uh, written like uh, we, that expresses a political and social ideology as well as an intent to do something to change the learning environment of the planet. So an appeal, look at that. If you know people or if you have any contact anywhere so we can find one more of these these activists in some unlikely place, you'll be doing a real service, not just to us and to yourself, but to everybody and next generations of this planet. Um, I think that's the time I'm supposed to stop, so I'll stop there. I don't have any minutes here for questions. Though. I think it's uh, time for that fine tradition uh, in baseball called the seventh inning stretch. So if you just like to stand in your seat for one second, okay, that's long enough. Now you can sit down. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ed Crawley. That really was just a second. Welcome to Technology Day. I'm Ed Crawley. I'm the rocket scientist here at MIT, the real one. I'm the head of the Aero Astro Department. And what I'd like to talk to you today about is airplanes, baseballs, and the fun of flight. Now, to commemorate this event, I've worn my baseball cap, which I wear when I'm flying. Or is it my flying cap that I wear when I play baseball? I'm not quite sure. What do we do at MIT? We develop technology and we invent things that never were. <laughs> Isn't that what we do? Science is the discovery of things that always have been. Technology is the inventions of things that never were. Theodore von Karman. We encourage learning. Sometimes we call this teaching, but of course the real objective is learning. We make contributions to society and we form the future. Those are modest goals that we have here at technology. 
Well, that's what we do and that's the outline of my talk. So first, to uh, have a, a short advertisement, I'd like to tell you about my department, which is called Aero Astro, Aeronautics and Astronautics Course 16, whose objectives are, objectives are to advance and disseminate knowledge of the principles and conception, design, implementation, and operation of things within its domain. And its domain starts here and goes up. So it includes aircraft, launch vehicles, spacecraft, things that go on the surface of the moon, things that go on the surface of Mars, photons which pass through that medium, we're in the telecommunication business, and of course baseballs, softballs, tennis balls, and such. Now is this a surprise that we should think about sports and baseballs in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics? I don't think so. You know, go out on Briggs Field on a Saturday afternoon and what do you find the students doing? Enjoying themselves by playing sports. They go home, they watch sports. You know, of course all the, all the dorms are now wired with cable TV and, and the web and of course we know what they use those for, which is not getting their homework assignments. It's really watching the Saturday afternoon baseball game. Well, Aero Astro is also exciting and cool. The students really love it. We get students in our department who by and large are those students who rode their bicycles down to the airport when they were young and watched the airplanes take off, who watched, who played hooky from school to watch the space vehicles take off. There's an excitement about our business as there's an excitement about sports. Sports, if you haven't noticed, are pretty high tech. The second largest consumer of graphite epoxy and titanium materials in the United States, for example, as a measure of high tech material usage is the sporting good industry. The largest usage of graphite epoxy and titanium in the United States is the Aero business. And if you really wanted to build a sporting good, I just happen to have one here, but I'll talk about later. If you really wanted to build this, what would you need to know about? Well, you'd need to know about lightweight structures, has to be light, aerodynamics, has to pass through the air, Human factors, has to have a good grip, can't give you tennis elbow. Information, maybe, you know. How long will it be before you buy a tennis racket with a microprocessor in it? <laughs> a year or two. <laughs> and of course you have to know about design. And what do you need to do to know about Aero Astro, to build things in Aero Astro? You need to know about lightweight structures like airplanes and spacecraft, aerodynamics to pass through the atmosphere, human factors in order to satisfy the pilots, information processing and flow, and of course design. So is it any surprise that people who do Aero Astro are also interested in sporting equipment? Shouldn't be. In fact, when I took a poll in preparation for this talk, I found that more than 50% of the faculty in our department had an avocational interest in sporting good design. They had consulted, they had designed, they had set st helped set standards and so forth. So I want to show you a little bit about the technology of sports. We'll have the first video. This is a high speed photo of a skier and I want you to look at the amount of vibration there is in these skis. Watch this. In fact, you turn on skis, you turn on the edge of skis, we all know that, but you actually turn on the edge of skis, look at this guy's leg by the way. If you don't think there isn't human factors going on in there, you turn on this edge of a ski that's on contact with the snow. But you can look at this and see that there's usually about a centimeter of displacement between the snow and the uh, ski edge. Look at this, uh, this guy's leg. Skis. Structures, dynamics, human factors. Watch the tennis ball go by. That was in modestly slow motion. You're a line judge at the uh, US Open and you have to call that, right? Now here it is in, in slow-mo and those two little lines of course represent the line. This is human perception and ball dynamics. The rule actually is if any of the footprint of the ball touches the line it's in. But the human eye can resolve about five milliseconds 
and this dynamic event is uh, significantly short, I'm sorry, 20 milliseconds, the, uh, the uh, dynamic event of this is about five seconds. There's the footprint. Was that ball in or out? That ball was in, but if you just saw it at that glimpse, it was out. Here's a bow, one of the oldest uh, tools of mankind. There's the arrow going off. Watch the dynamics of the bow, and particularly this piece right in here. Never would have thought that a bow shook around that much. Now watch this. This is an absolutely amazing shot by this uh, archer who is going to shoot an arrow which is right about in there towards us. Watch out, duck. Here it comes. He's about to release it right there. There's the release. Watch the arrow. It's the highest stiffness arrow that's made, a, gra a graphite fiber shaft arrow. Away from the club's center of gravity, giving the club a very high resistance to twisting. Listen to the claims. Thus, off-centered hits do not twist a metal wood club as much as conventional woods. Less twisting, reduced torque, results in straighter shots and increased distance. May be true or may not. The external weight placement in metal woods also allows the weight to be placed lower and farther behind the ball than a conventional wood. The resulting lower center of gravity creates a more efficient energy transfer of the club head's mass through the ball for more consistent, longer hits. May be true, may not. The metal wood design also offers advantages in increased club head speed through the ball. The narrow hosel and aerodynamic design minimize air resistance, generating greater club head speed. The consistent quality of... May be true, may not. Now, why is it interesting to talk with students about such things? Well, we actually use, through design or accident, the uh, discussion of sporting goods throughout almost the entire curriculum. There are several of us who teach freshman seminars. Uh, freshman seminars are a process now at MIT, if you don't quite remember them, where every freshman is assigned to a faculty advisor mentor who advises them through the freshman year before they designate a course, but also teaches them a seminar. I teach one on sporting good design, and I use it to teach students the business of engineering, which is making products that make people's lives better, in this case, sporting goods, because students can get their hands around a sporting good, a piece of sporting equipment. They can understand it. I also subtly use it to show the value of freshman physics. You know, freshman physics is in one of those big lecture halls and they're not quite sure what's going on. So for example, I show them the video that you just saw there uh, and I let them listen to the claims that are made about that golf club. There were three claims. Let's see if we can remember what they are. They were that perimeter weighting the head of the club increases its moment of inertia and is ca is causes the ball to go straighter with an off-center hit. True or false? False? I'd like to see you and revoke your 801 grade after the... Uh... More or less true. More or less true. If you work out the dynamics, if you have a high moment of inertia club head and you hit off-center, it's less likely to twist during the, the, the time of impact. A low CG, low center of gravity, causes the club to strike the ball more consistently and drive it farther, was the claim. True or false? There's no model of the dynamics of a club that I can construct that caused that to be true. And thirdly, aer making the head aerodynamic increases the head velocity at the time of ball impact. True or false? Hmm. How many people think false? How many people think true? Well, it sort of depends is the answer. <laughs> Let me ask you a simpler question which I ask my freshmen. What's the optimum head mass for a golf club? Fix the mass of the ball. What's the optimum head mass of the, uh, of the head, of the club? All the mass is in the head, by the way, for all practical purposes. It can't exceed a certain amount. It can't exceed a certain amount according to the rules of golf, I think. That's right. Thank you. There's the lawyer. 
<laughs> and, and this stresses an important point, which is that regulation comes into sports just as it does into aircraft and spacecraft. So in fact, you can't exceed the head that's listed in the rules of golf. But aside from that, would you rather make it lower or higher? Well, it depends on your model of the human kinematics, really. If you model the body as something that can produce a constant velocity, you want to make it higher. If you model the body as that something that produces a torque, which has to accelerate the head of the club, you want to make it lower. Okay. So are you a torque source or a velocity source when you swing your club? Well, I'll let you think about that. Okay. But lastly, and certainly, letting students think about sporting goods, like letting them think about anything, in fact, is a design, an outlet for their creative instincts. Let me show you the final assignment in my freshman seminar last fall, which was to design a new sport. Let's forget about a, piece, a new tennis racket. Let's design a whole new sport, right? This was the idea they came up with. First, they said the fastest growing sport amongst our generation is lacrosse. I didn't know that, but, it, taught, but it, it indicated to me that I had taught them to think about market factors, which was a valuable thing to look at, learn. Seems like an obvious lesson if you ever tried to sell anything, but not if you're a freshman, perhaps. Then they observed that lacrosse sticks are hard to use and hard to learn to use, so they redesigned the lacrosse stick using 801 freshman physics. That made me happy. But then they observed that essentially sports are, uh, are, uh, are a, a, a way to represent on a small field warfare. And warfare is tactical, and you push people forward and back. And essentially all sports except for baseball and uh, cricket and a few others, um, all, uh, certainly all field sports, involved the dynamics of pushing forward on the offense and retreating on the defense. And they said, what would happen if we changed that? What would happen if we said that Team A defends this goal and this goal, and Team B defends this goal and this goal? <laughs> so now, a ball in the middle here, if it pops out that way, you have to run back and be on defense. But if it pops out that way, you also have to run back and be on defense. Sort of an interesting idea. Huh? The sort of things that MIT students are likely to come up with if you just say, invent something. So there's a pedagogic value in our education to talking about the design of things, letting students build things, whether they're sporting goods or spacecraft. The first is, and this may seem a little obvious to all of the people in the room except the faculty, that the conception, design, implementation, and operation of things which serve to humanity is the business of engineering. And once in a while, we should say that to students. You know, it mixed in amongst the, the discussion of theory and the, the quest for cutting edge research, we should signal them to the fact that it's OK to really build things and help people. If you were trying to construct a pedagogic structure for an aero-astro curriculum, you would then say, OK, let's have students build some spacecraft. Possible, but not, at the, not a really accessible at the undergraduate level. Let's have them build some aircraft. Possible, but not really expectable in the scope of a semester subject. OK, so what could you have them build in the course of a semester subject which would conceive, design, implement, and operate, incorporate the technologies of aerospace. A piece of sporting good equipment is not a bad idea. So sports give us a ready application centered on the same disciplines that we use in aerospace. Uh, the next piece of video is going to show you another thing that we do in the sophomore year, fresh, yeah, sophomore year. It isn't possible to have students, I'm sorry, freshman year. It isn't students, possible to have students build an airplane but you can have them build a blimp in a semester. And this is a, uh, coming right into focus now, a, a, a subject taught by one of my colleagues, David Newman. And the, uh, it's the second term freshman subject. And at the end of the semester, they design and build a blimp. This is a radio control blimp. It looks like someone's holding it, but in fact they aren't. They're just sort of standing by it. 
Blimps move slow, they're really s relatively simple, they produce lift with buoyancy so you don't have to know much about aerodynamics, and this may in fact be the next NCAA sport, you see. <laughs> the students really enjoy this, uh, and we enjoy watching them too, and taking after our colleague Woody Flowers, we actually let them compete. That's it for that video. When they're sophomores, we have an approach called unified engineering, which takes four subjects in the freshman year, a uh, sophomore year, and mushes them all together. So they're educated in an integrative environment where they learn that the structures person has to know what the fluids person is doing. They all have to be organized by the control person. There's some thermodynamics involved. And they do problems that are called systems problems, which cause them to bring together all of these aspects and either do an integrative analysis or an integrative design. Now one of my colleagues, Steve Hall, decided that an interesting integrative design project this past spring would be to have them build a glider, right? A glider is actually not a bad thing for sophomores to build. You know, it has aerodynamics, but it doesn't have propulsion. It's relatively easy to test. And he got the idea by some collaborative interaction of actually making contact with a toy company, uh, Hasbro, the manufacturer of Nerf, and using the sophomore class to design the replacement for this, the Nerf airplane, you see. So the Hasbro guys came and talked about the market. You know, the toy, the toy business is segmented in a certain way, and the, the market size is so much, and so forth. They talked about the design requirements, and the, the subtle one for this toy is it has to be enjoyable by four or five-year-olds who will throw it like this. But I am a rated pilot, so it's OK. <laughs> but it has to also be enjoyable by 10-year-olds who will throw it like this. Right? And this toy actually fails because it trims nose up uh, in steady state flight so that when you throw it hard, it pitches up and stalls. There are regulations. Sure, there's no regulations on toys, right, in America? <laughs> it's probably easier to satisfy the federal airworthiness regulations than the toy safety regulations. So they were actually presented with a book of essentially the regulations of building toys. Then they had to come up with a concept. They had to do the aerodynamic analysis and the stress analysis. And they had to make it design for manufacturability, another innovative concept to, to get across to students. And in fact, this is a very low cost toy. It's stamped out of pieces of foam. So if you could get it out of one piece of foam, that was the best. If you could get it out of two pieces of foam, that was the better, and so forth. And then finally, we had a set of flight tests. The students were captivated by this project. The, the instructors said that they absorbed this stuff uh, that we teach them in the second semester like sponges compared to semesters when we didn't do a project like this. Because of course, while they were learning about flight dynamics, they were designing a glider. While they were learning about beams, they were doing the analysis of a wing. The more of that we can do at MIT, the happier our students will be. We have a, an exercise in the junior and senior years where teams of students work together to identify a research project and then execute it over the course of two uh, semesters. Uh, they have to design the experiment, and they have to take data. It's not sufficient to, for example, write a computer program. There has to be, it has to be an experiment. There has to be data produced, which they have to be able to analyze and compare with a model. And then, of course, they report. We use this as a vehicle for a lot of communication skills in particular. We let the students, by and large, choose their own projects. And not surprisingly, a lot of them come up with sporting goods. This is one project, which is, of course, a plaster cast of a hand, which was used by a team of students to determine the aerodynamic drag on a hand. Because, of course, they were competitive swimmers. And the question that rages in the swimming community is do you get the maximum efficiency by having your hand like this or like this? Is it better to? form a little more projected plan form or to cup it. So they actually did the aerodynamic studies at the right Reynolds number of two plaster casts of hands to see which had the higher drag coefficient. And the answer is 
I don't quite remember, unfortunately, so. <laughs> but the MIT team, swim team has been winning. <laughs> so just in case there are any alumna of other universities here, <laughs> we don't want to give up any. Uh... Back to golf clubs, you of course recognize this is your Saturday afternoon hobby. Usually it's instrumented about like this, right? This is uh, given to us kindly by, the, uh, by Callaway. We've done uh, quite, a, quite a few tests on, uh, on uh, golf club dynamics. I actually use this in my freshman seminar, uh, and I've had a few uh, undergraduate projects. The real questions are things like, does anything matter? You know? <laughs> if you... Uh, you know, if you went out to the average Saturday golfer and gave him a driver and told him that Tiger Woods had just won with this one, he or she would probably drive it farther, right? Because there's some interesting psychophysiological feedback that occurs in golf. You know, if you think you're going to hit the ball well, you usually do. Uh, the average drive distance on the Pro Tour over the last decade has gone up five yards. Um, so every time you see a Saturday afternoon ad, that says, our driver drives 20 yards farther. Good marketing. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the ball is in contact with the head of a club for a half a millisecond. Uh, and there's not an awful lot you can do to anything to change the events in a half a millisecond. <laughs> there are some quasi-static effects, you know, that you actually get to teach them about centrifugal de-stiffening as you bring the club down at 100 feet per second and the club bends. That's a real effect. Um, so we play around with golf clubs. Tennis is a big one. These are two experimental tennis rackets. This is my uh, colleague Ramnath. This one, I don't know if you can hear it. Can you hear that? It has powder in it. So this is to provide extra damping when you impact the ball, which is thought to reduce the uh, tennis elbow problem. And this one has fluid. Uh, which zings around in the, in the outside. There's actually a fluid tube in here, which is thought, according to RAM, somehow to increase the, uh, the actual delivered power because of variable geometry. And students do experiments in this. We actually have a test facility, if you want to call it that, where uh, we do uh, measurements on on if I pull this, I'm almost certainly going to take the skin off of this part of my, my, my arm. I used to do that in summer camp all the time, but they weren't this strong. The compound bow, perhaps one of the oldest pieces of technology on the planet, found in the tomb of King Tut was something called a compound bow where there were three types of materials in, used to build up the bow starting from the hardest on the center line, which I think was ivory, to wood to leather. The ancient Egyptians understood that by varying the, the modulus of elasticity of the material away from the neutral axis, an archer could store more strain energy uh, in the bow and shoot the arrow farther. Okay. Well, we're still doing that, you know, except now they're advanced composite graphite epoxy and all sorts of bells and whistles. This one, again, is heavily strain gauged to understand the strain energy distribution uh, during launch. The students love to do these things. You know, we find consistently that the projects the students initiate are significantly more successful than the ones that the professors say, well, let's test this new widget. You know, at MIT, we have a tradition of actually doing things in addition to educating students. And this is just a list of some of the things in the sporting good business that uh, my colleagues and I have done over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, if you um, go down a ski slope now, you're about three times less likely to injure yourself through an ankle or leg break than you would have been a decade or so ago, thanks to the ASTM ski binding regulations set by the ASTM ski snow skiing committee chaired or formerly chaired by Larry Young, one of my colleagues. It's reduced the ski binding related injuries from six per thousand skier days to two per thousand skier days. 
pretty significant uh, benefit. Um, JAR 22 is joint airworthiness requirement. It's a European standard for powerless aircraft, including gliders. It used to be thought that you could not protect a pilot in a high performance glider from a crash impact, a nose down crash impact. Uh, and actually a student of mine was killed in one of such impacts, which caused me and one of my colleagues, Hansman, to consider whether it was, this was really the case. We had a set of students over several years build one quarter scale models and crash them in our laboratory and prove to the world that you can in fact protect a glider, a pilot, as well as any pilot in any aircraft. And as a result, the airworthiness requirements were changed to require uh, such protection. Uh, on a little lighter note, one of my other colleagues, Ramnath, uh, has established the standards for the pro tennis tour uh, line calling machines. Um, as you may be aware, increasingly in pro tennis, the lines are called by machine, not by human eye. Uh, and we haven't actually invented one of the machines, but we've been involved in the regulation of what the specification of the line calling machines are. Now these three form a pattern, which, they, which is that they put us in a research role for the regulatory agency. Uh, skis, airplanes, pro tennis. And that's something that I think is appropriate for MIT as an organization to do. We have also been involved in for-profit ventures, uh, that is to say individuals amongst us. I don't know if you can see this. Well, but this is a uh, softball bat. By the way, softball is the big market, you know. Nobody plays pro baseball with a wooden bat. Everyone plays, you know, Saturday afternoon softball in Little League with metal bats. And this is a dimpled bat, dimpled just like a golf ball, so that when you swing, you, it'll go faster. Provided, of course, that you model the human as a velocity source <laughs> and not as a torque source. Now, what I'm very proud of it in this ball, and you can't see this, so I'll read it to you, is that it says power stick, which is sort of good marketing, right? <laughs> and it actually says on here, delayed boundary layer separation. <laughs> now, I'm not sure who they think out there in America is going to understand that. But I'm particularly proud that something came out of the Aero Department has on the side of a delayed boundary layer separation. <laughs> because it might actually cause some kid out there someplace to ask his dad, as they're getting the ice cream after the baseball game, Dad, what's a boundary layer? <laughs> the best-selling ski in America, the K24, has a brain inside the ski done by a colleague of mine, Haygood, who has the original idea, and uh, manufactured by another s former student of mine, Lazarus, at a company called ACX. The ski uses new technology. This is a little point of purchase sticker, which is on the ski when you buy it. This ski uses new technology developed by MIT trained engineers. <laughs> now we're really making an impact in America, you see. <laughs> Now, this ski really works. You see, what happens is you saw the video of the vibration of the ski uh, on the snow. And in fact, uh, the average height of the ski off the snow surface is almost a centimeter. If you reduce the vibration amplitude incre by increasing the damping or dissipation of the ski, it vibrates less and more of the ski is in contact with the surface. So you can really plant an edge and turn on it. And that's done by a little piezoelectric material patch here which takes the energy from mechanical energy and to electrical energy and then dissipates it in a resistor, which is in here. But now the really cool thing is that when you're in the showroom and you whack it, there's a little LED that lights up there. <laughs> now we know that's going to help your skiing. There are three great traditions at MIT. Hacks, sports, and technology. So if you can find something that combines all three of these, boy, you've got a winner, right? And we have these things from time to time in the department that we just call special projects. 
which are almost always student initiated, the successful ones are almost always student initiated, that combine these aspects of hack, sports, and technology. They're an outlet for creativity and competitiveness. They're usually long duration. They're almost always voluntarily. The students do it nights and weekends and uh, vacations and summers. Uh, and I think that they really add a tremendous amount to the, the educational value of the students. We have a, a couple of slides of the history of some of these. Um, I built one of these uh, when I was an undergraduate at MIT. Uh, and they're uh, of the flavor of, uh... oh, thank you. <laughs> they're of the flavor of human-powered airplanes. Uh, we've built other things, but I'll, I'll show you the human-powered airplane family. This was the first one called the Biplane Ultralight Research Device, BIRD which was a two-pedaler biplane uh, intended to fly for the first Kramer Prize, which was to fly a mile around a figure eight pylon. Uh, total uh, pylons were half a mile apart. Uh, and there's the propeller. Uh, and the peddlers would sit there and there, and it flies that way, by the way. Um, and there's a young future head of the aero department right there with uh, more hair. Um, this one uh, crashed. Next slide. <laughs> Here's it, uh, the next one in the family. This is called Crystallis, also a biplane. Now it flies like a conventional airplane, uh, built by uh, some colleagues of mine, including Mark Drela, John Langford, who now runs Aurora Flight. Uh, this was a very good trainer, uh, and it was also built by us to compete with Paul McCready in the Cross English Channel competition, which Paul beat us. But this would have flown Dover to Calais. Next slide. This is Monarch. Uh, there's the single pilot flying uh, in that direction. This was built by essentially the same team of students uh, from the last uh, airplane. Um, and this was uh, designed to win the third Kramer Prize competition of the Royal Aeronautical Society, which was for, the f was for speed, for human-powered speed flight. And the first winner would be for the first team that flew more than 20 miles an hour. Uh, and this plane achieved that uh, flying out at Hanscom uh, uh, Airfield. So this was our first win in the human-powered flight. Now, you have to think for just a second, and I think the next slide will show this, what it really takes. Oops. <laughs> Could you go back one slide? Oak, uh, fig leaves is what it takes. <laughs> what it takes for a group of students to build one of these. I mean, first they have to decide they want to do it. This is a several year effort. They have to decide they want to do it, and they know they're going to do it nights and weekends and holidays and vacations and so forth. They have to design the plane. They have to raise money to build it within the MIT system. Then they have to find the space to build it, one of the most daunting tasks at MIT. Uh, then they have to actually engage in the construction, go out to the flight facility in Bedford, put the whole thing together, flight test it. And you flight test human-powered airplanes, by the way, when the winds are very low, early in the morning. Uh, and then, of course, uh, coordinate the whole team. It's really a marvelous effort. And the students who participate in projects like this in any department derive a tremendous benefit from the education. Well, after we had won the human, the human powered speed prize, there was one, only one grand challenge left. Next slide. Which was to reproduce the mythical flight of Daedalus. Uh, and Daedalus, of course, uh, was a real person. He was an engineer in the court of the king of Athens who fled to Crete, where he got in trouble with the king there and fled again. And in one of those flights, he is said to actually have flown. Icarus, by the way, was added by the Romans to the myth. Daedalus is a real, real person. Uh, he's in, credited with inventing the saw and the lathe, among other things. Icarus was added by the Romans to make the moral of the story, listen to your father. <laughs> so if I could have the, uh, the last video now. Uh, this team of students created uh, this airplane. Everyone
anyone who has witnessed Whoops. a flight of the Monarch agrees it is truly a thrilling sight and almost takes you back to the days of early flight with Wilbur and Orville Wright. Now, the MIT students tell us they have fulfilled all the requirements, followed all the rules, and they're just waiting. This is, uh, this is Daedalus taking off for an well, airport the in Crete. Part of this project is officially over. This is uh, Professor Mussolari in the, in the chase boat. Uh, the flight of Daedalus, there, there is no uh, agreement amongst the historians and mythologists about which two islands he flew between. So we flew from Crete, which was the capital, uh, the capital of Knossos, to the island of Santorini, which is agreed to be amongst one of the probable courses. It's about a three-hour flight. It's about 80 miles. Uh, we had four pilots in training. Uh, I believe four or five pilots in training, one of whom was a Greek really Olympic good, yeah. bicycle athlete. Great. They were all Olympic awesome. caliber bicyclists. And they rotated, just like the Mercury astronauts. And on the morning of the actual good conditions, it turned out that it was the Greeks' day, which made everyone in Greece very happy that a Greek man actually got to fly this. So we take off from, um, from Crete in the background there at a Greek military installation. Why don't you just turn up the volume enough so you don't go up there? Better than perfect. My boss now goes to 30s, upper 30s. Among other things, we invented human fuel in the course of this project. The Greek Navy, Coast Guard, and Air Force uh, are the on the pilot actually got dribbled support. to him, uh, and a specially prepared clear. solution of uh, but sugars and, uh, seem to and such things, help. carbohydrates, the so that he could basically suck human you. fuel. If you could do that in a marathon, you'd never hit the wall. The only concern is that it will all be over too soon. On the actual day of the flight, there was a considerable tailwind. So although we were only flying about 15 knots, uh, the, uh, over the speed over the ground or over the bottom of the ocean was about 20 knots. The only landmarks now are the world records falling one by one. First down is the Gossamer Albatross straight line record of 22 miles. That was the cross channel flight. Then it's the Light Eagle's absolute distance mark at 37 miles. Which is one of our planes. Finally, the Gossamer Albatross duration record at 2 hours and 49 minutes. That was the cross channel flight. But the records have become almost a footnote to the experience. The greater satisfaction now comes from the realization of a dream, a modern mythical creature, half man, half machine, living out the earliest fantasy of flight. Almost four hours into the journey, Daedalus approaches its final goal, the island of Santorini. Okay, Santorini Beach, this is command boat. We're going to want you to get ready to lay the smoke for us. Uh, we're gonna it's just the over those boats. The flight has been flawless, almost routine. Canelos could probably keep going for hours, but the gods are not going to let the mortals off so easily. The wind is suddenly picked up. Steve, the smoke is coming out. Canellos will have to come in parallel to the beach for an upwind landing. Okay, let's get the beach clear, beach people. And uh, Canellos, I want 20 degrees to the right. Give me a good right turn. We gotta have, I want to give you plenty of room to approach that landing site. Over. Okay, don't worry. I never worry. Okay, they look good now. Okay, we've got a big headwind here. We're barely making any way at all. Um, Canelos, uh, that looks good. Maintain this heading. There are people running on the beach now. I think there's a lot of people running. Okay, well, don't worry about them. We're going to land where they aren't. Caught in the strong headwind, Canelos is having trouble approaching the beach. Okay, maintain that heading. Maintain so you can see heading. he's about... 30 right yards there, from, from uh, Santorini. Okay, you're looking good, Canellas. A little bit of a right hand correction. A little bit of a right hand correction. Be easy, keep the. Uh oh. Uh oh. A gust of wind snapped the tail boom and then the wing, turning Daedalus can, uh, into Icarus. Listen to your dad. The first thought is for the safety of Canellas. You can uh, cut the video there, thanks. 
Uh, I was not on the beach that morning. Yeah. That applause, of course, is for the team of students and faculty who did that, of which I was not a member, but I, I will accept it on their behalf. Uh, the, uh, I was not there that morning, but I'm told by John Langford, who was the project leader, that if you don't believe in the gods of Olympus, that their influence that day was just palpable. You know? They were going to let these mortals get so far, <laughs> and then they were just going to reach down at the last second and crush that little airplane. Well, in conclusion, Barton Rogers said some interesting things. That we should provide an education relevant to an industrializing nation. You know, maybe now we'd say it's an industrialized or maybe even post-industrial nation. That our education should be pragmatic and practical. That we should have teaching coupled with hands-on education. And that technical education is an appropriate basis uh, for a professional education at the undergraduate level. That is the founding dream of the Institute. I think that the more we keep that in mind and the more we keep pushing ourselves towards that goal, the better job we do for our students and our future. But Barton Rogers never said it couldn't be fun. All right. That was something they sort of got added in the, uh, in the interpretation over the years. <laughs> so we try and keep it fun as well. Uh, and in fact, we think it's so much fun that we've decided to create a center for sports engineering here at MIT. Uh, part, and partly uh, inspired by preparing for this talk, we pulled together all of the faculty who were involved in this and who had done these things, and we said, you know, boy, there's really something here. So we've put together a cooperative group of people from Aero Astro, uh, Warren Searing's NSF Center for uh, Innovation and Product Development, and the Department of Athletics, who are thrilled by this, by the way, because now they have a, 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 some access into the intellectual life of the Institute. <laughs> uh, and our goal is to create new sports, new products, and new standards for sports. And we're going to start this in the fall of 97 with some uh, freshman seminars. Uh, and uh, this uh, activity is going to be home-based in the Wright Brothers Wind Tunnel which is a big enough wind tunnel to stand bicyclists and tennis players up and actually measure their aerodynamics. So there is, in some senses, a long-standing uh, legacy of this presentation this morning. Well, I enjoyed putting this together. Thank you. And I have the honor of being followed here on the podium this morning by uh, one of my uh, truly esteemed colleagues who has, in fact, been the guy who has shown many of us the way to uh, incorporate design and engineering into the undergraduate curriculum, Professor Woody Flowers. Thank you, sir. Good morning. More about that later. Um, it's great to be here. Welcome back. I, I've seen some very young people in the audience, so we probably should do a duel. There's some people here for the first time. I'm really glad you could come. This is a very, very special event when you get uh, a thousand MIT alums and their family members in a room. Uh, it's impressive. There, there is a, a lot of power here today. In fact, you're a wonderfully intimidating audience, and I'm looking forward to talking to you. The opportunity cost of this meeting is really high, so I will try to make it worth your while. Now, <clears throat> the title of my talk was a bit presumptuous, but the real title wouldn't fit. The words that I've added at the top are to make it a little more humble. I don't know about hard fun, but I think there are some things. I think that you guys really know quite a lot. 
Um, <clears throat> Dave, if you could get on focus. Um, you can read that list. The, the examples are going to be five examples. I will warn you I'm going to go fast because I, have, I want you to get to lunch on time. I have ten and a half minutes of video and about a hundred slides, so <laughs> heads up. But I will get you there. So <clears throat> what is hard fun? Well, I, I don't know. Um, you know, there are lots of ways to interpret it. Several people have talked about it this morning. This is hard fun for me. Uh, you're, uh, as I said, an intimidating audience. So it was really hard to think about what I might say to you that might represent a reasonably cohesive message. So I think that hard fun lies at the intersection of, of learning and hard work and uh, some fun. And I think you guys probably really understand that. <clears throat> I think uh, Vladimir was right. You know, you do have to have both and you do have to mix them. But I think this quote probably talks more directly to you guys than the other. You can't make people happy by taking away the things that make them unhappy. You have spent your careers doing hard fun and using hard fun to obtain various kinds of satisfaction, some of them very transient or orgasmic, and some of them long and subtle things that develop that have to do with satisfaction with the life of your family and your career. But you have engaged in lots of hard fun. So I defer to you. You probably know more about it than me. In the talk, I'm going to make reference to several authors. I'm going to cop out and talk about maybe what some other people might have said about the topic. And it's appropriate to start with seasons. For the ladies in the audience, you can think passages. But I'm reminded of the infamous survey which discovered that MIT alums about five years out think, boy, I wish I'd learned calculus and physics a little better. And about 15 years out, they say, oh, if I'd just gotten the economics and management stuff down a little better. And then about 20 or 30 years later, they say, boy, if I'd just studied philosophy. I think <laughs> I have shifted. You know, I'm, I'm kind of on schedule and uh, I'm, I'm changing. Um, <laughs> This, this process started for me in, in about 1970. I don't know exactly when this picture was taken. I, uh, my hair was a little denser at that point, and a little more plentiful. But if I were giving this talk then, I would have talked more about the details of the machines and the process. But I want to pull back today and talk in a more general way. Now, as I said, I don't think we know the answers, but we have learned a few things. And I'd like to give you some examples. I'm going to stick to things that I know about because I was directly involved with them and therefore maybe a little safer in making comments. First, I'd like to show you a video about the 270 contest. It is uh, a whole bunch of students, uh, kit of materials, and for the most part, it's a sophomore level course. For the most part, they're designing and building something for the first time in their life. So if we could have the first video, please. Christina's Deadly Wedge is a perfect example of the fast and low design strategy. Oh, you got it. You got it. Oh, yeah. She notches yet another convincing victory as more and more opponents bite the dust. This is a three minute clip from the program Discover. Right there because I had my thing right underneath him and he couldn't get into the area. This power shovel machine is also moving up fast. Tony chose a good design and built it well. It took a lot of time. It took me a long time, but I, I thought that I took a lot of care in what I, you know, in what I built. Tony deploys his shovel and moves steadily toward the summit. He rocks the joystick confidently and gets the shovel under the other machine. It's another win for Tony, and he advances toward the semi-final round of the competition. Every battle now is a fierce one, and the losers go out in style. There's really only one person I'm really scared of now, and I think I have to go against her next, too. Christina and her wedge machine face Key's low rider in the first semi-final match. They both hope to plant their ping pong balls on the mountaintop, but Christina is faster. Her wedge gets under Key's defenses, and gravity does the rest. She has the best car here. She's going to win, no problem. Now
Now it's Bob with an arm machine up against Tony in the other semifinal. Tony takes off confidently and lowers the shovel. Bob rolls up to meet him, but Tony has something in reserve. A design that combines the best of both strategies. He raises a short, stubby arm, backs into the zone, and pulls off another win. And so Tony lines up against Christina in the final battle. Ready? Get set? Go! Christina races toward the top in pursuit of another quick victory. But Tony digs in and waits for her to release her ball. The power shovel gets under her wedge. She's almost upended. Tony goes to work on the defenseless ping pong ball. Back up, back up, back up now. Back up, back up again. To heighten the victory, Tony fires his arm, and he wins. So, remember all of that. There will be a quiz later. I'd like to get on with another example and tell you a little bit about an organization called FIRST, which is founded by a wonderfully crazy, wild, and successful man, extremely intelligent man named Neem Kamen. FIRST has been around for six years. Uh, the design competition part of it uh, started uh, just after Dean and I met, and it's a little bit like 270 on steroids. The recent, uh, the recent competition involved 155 teams. There was a regional in Chicago, in New Hampshire, and in New Jersey, and then the Nationals were at Epcot. Uh, we're looking forward to a very, very big year this coming year. In the last year, uh, Pre President Best was kind enough to sponsor the MIT team. If you really love me, during this video, you will write down that 800 number. In particular, if you're involved with a company that might be interested in working with MIT and a high school in order to do this. The video that I want you to see now is a three-minute rap show that was part of the introduction to the awards ceremony at the, 19, at the recent finals at Epcot um, in Florida. So if we can start the second video.
So that was a, unless something unexpected happens, you will all get a chance to see uh, some of the stories associated with FIRST uh, in the fall or winter. Uh, sorry, I can't say more about that, but uh, I think there's a good chance that lots of folks in the country will know about it. Now, the other thing I'd like to show you is a quick video clip, which was uh, very personal to me. If we can start the next video, please. At GTE, the power is on. Hi, my name's Woody Flowers. I know that sounds like the name of a cartoon character, but it's easy to remember and it's always served me well. I'm actually a professor at MIT with a lot of curiosity about the world around me and how it works, which is why I'm standing here dressed like a skydiver. This new series is gonna explore the frontiers of science and I'm gonna to get to go along for the ride. I'm gonna ask some questions, maybe answer a few, poke fun occasionally, and test some of the frontiers myself, which brings me back to the skydiving outfit. I've always wondered what it would be like to jump out of a plane. So I'm going to find out. Stop left turn. Those are nice, swift turns. This is a 3D sports car. Here I come. Three, two, one, clear. All right, great. Good there'll, job, be a quiz. there'll be a quiz on that too later. So those are three examples. Let me move on to some more. Let me talk a little bit about our, uh, our senior product engineering course and uh, what we do there. We, uh, we're really mean to the students. Uh, in order to force some of the issues that are very important to engineering teamwork and projects, we give them a problem too big and a time too short, groups too large, and a budget too small. Very close simulation of the stuff that Steve talked about earlier. Now, the students' reaction is, uh, as you might expect, <laughs> but they've really been quite fantastic in the past. They, uh, they start the process with, more meetings than they've ever had in their lives and they have to learn about meetings and then they get into doing some calculations and using their engineering science and they find themselves pouring over catalogs and finding out that dealers and that vendors don't deliver when they said they were going to. They <clears throat> learn a lot of lessons about simple tools. They use some fairly uh, more elegant tools. They use some, some modern processes in doing this wonderful job of building mock-ups and then finally a prototype. And they, uh, they work together, they help each other, they work very intensely. A team of 25 students who are taking several other courses at the same time have to learn to break the problem up, trust one another, and get it done. So there's an enormous amount of tension associated with making this happen. But we've been doing it for six years now, and every time the students have finished with a machine or a device that met spec was on time and under budget. That's really quite amazing. Now they make a mess in the process, but at the end of it, they have some quite remarkable things. From last fall, for example, this was a battery-operated boogie board for kids, uh, a little battery-operated surfboard, essentially, a toy. The, here was an industrial scooter for use inside plants, and had a nice cargo, uh, extendable cargo deck. One of the machines was uh, the most powerful and fast sea sled for wreck divers, and great video of it outrunning the fastest uh, sled on the market today. And there was a battery operated wheelbarrow which they aimed at uh, the domestic market and discovered that there were lots of construction sites where inside buildings you couldn't use uh, gasoline engines and that was a very good idea as well. 
Uh, there was a very delightful design of a confined space rescue system. That serpentine capstan that you see there gripped the rope and would allow a battery pack to lift someone out of a well or some of the other confined space uh, rescue areas. So that was uh, celebrated by the, MI the uh, Cambridge rescue team. And the scooter that you just saw is uh, a commuter scooter that allows one to fold it down and take off and, and as you see, uh, works quite well and is really a lot of fun. Now, they then at the end of this process give very professional presentations in which they present their business plan, they present their knowledge of the market, and they do that in front of a critical audience and get some real feedback about what people think of their ideas. We think that that kind of whole process is very, very important. Now, they also experience a kind of bonding and unity. At the end of this whole thing, there's a lot of shared feeling of relief, among other things. But several years ago, for instance, when we did battery-operated riding lawnmowers, all the teams were anxious to gather out in the great court. In fact, the entire course gathered out in the great court. They've been through something that pulls them all together, and it had to do with pushing the envelope as far as it would tolerate without tearing it. So it's hard fun. Let me talk a little bit about a product, a graduate design course that Professor David Wallace and I teach. Uh, most of the focus is on aesthetics and, and human factors. We tell them, you know, that this is a course about process, and process is really first, but then we say we lie, it's about good products too. So the students, even though many of them have never had a drafting course, even do a very good job of raising the bar for one another and doing renderings, for example, that look quite good to industrial designers. You know, they're not going to take industrial designers' job, but they've done a lot about communicating their ideas to other people. Very sophisticated move forward in a very short time. They then make sketch models out of foam, and they all assemble together, and each person has three sketch models, and they present them. And what they then do is exchange ideas among one another about the sketch models. And that particular exchange is very rich in communications. It's, cr it's rich in critique. Engineers don't generally want to have anyone criticizing their ideas. But we try to get them to understand that critique is not criticizing. It's helping to develop a better idea. So they do a fantastic job of helping one another, working together. And in fact, almost always, their design evolves in some way during that process. Now, at the end of that, they get down to the hard business of making the real visual model. And they spend a lot of time in the lab together. They get to know each other very, very well. And they see one another doing things. And they all kind of do it better and better because of that. And as that process uh, moves through, all of the stuff that each student done is done with their own hands. And they end up with a very proud attachment to what they've done. Then they have created these nice visual models. This was a series that had to do with a personal digital assistant for traffic and, and weather. And the ideas are quite diverse. And it's really great to see the range in creativity. Some of the devices are very, very convincing. They look like real prototypes. What they then do, if I could have the next tray, please, is we gather a very substantial audience for them, a jury. This last semester, there were 35 students. We had 40 jurors. And the students present their ideas to the jury. And the jury includes people like Bill Mitchell, dean of architecture, and representatives of most of the design firms in the Boston area. So they get real pros to look over their work, give them feedback, fill out forms, exchange ideas with them. And it's done with a great deal of enthusiasm, and the students really get a lot out of it, and they are very anxious to see what the people said. One of the nice things is that that puts us in a position of being the coach rather than the evaluator. This uh, last semester was uh, wearable computers. One of the uh, models, uh, a quite elegantly done model by Tom Almy, he here is getting some feedback from an industrial designer from a local firm who had spent quite a lot of time on exactly that same problem. A lot of rich feedback. So that process is, uh, is different than a final exam. It's very rich in information back. So I've given you five examples. Great, a lot of good stuff happening, but uh, what does it mean? Well, I don't know, but some thoughts. 
One is for sure that we think Einstein is right. Creativity is very, very important part of this process and uh, we must overtly charge the students with being creative. Warren Searing is right. You know, the way you get students to be creative is you assign it. If you don't make it part of the process, it ain't going to happen. It's the painful part. It's not the default thing. It's risky. It makes your brain hurt. And it's delightful when we say, please do it, they do it. If you look at this series of machines, they were all in 270 a year or so ago, and they were all done to accomplish the same task. Delightful variety in what they looked like. They were all effective in their own ways. This one had counter-rotating augers to screw its way through the, uh, the medium of the contest that year. Now, here's Alex Slocum with a group of the students that went off to, uh, to the international version of the design contest. Alex has been running the course for the last three years. Before him was Harry West. Harry did a great job of creating the international version. Wonderful tradition. It continues to grow. We think it has some very powerful lessons. But the context for all of these things is exercising, developing, your creative design skills and creating a different self-image of yourself. You have to be able to trust your ability to be creative. A lot of people, uh, including myself, think that uh, Scott Adams will be regarded as one of the 20th century's great philosophers. I, I think that's probably right, but here's one example. You know, the, the uh, Wally and I have come up with a great new product idea, management, inspiration, alert, in effect, danger, new idea. You know, here's Crush-O-Matic, which is about to splat the creator of the new idea. In order to have an impact on the world and push creative ideas, you have to have the courage. You know, it takes about a dozen Your Baby is Uglies to get one Eureka. And so you have to leave the educational system fortified enough to take a beating over and over and still come back asking for more. I still remember this student's coming into my office and crying because she didn't want to take the course she never built anything, she hated the whole idea, and she ended up feeling so good about having made this machine do what she wanted it to do that she became a design engineer. That, I think, is one of the, the real victories, what it's all about. Another thing that is a facet of this hard, fun activity is what I've started calling gracious professionalism. It's really, really nice to see students working closely together, you know, helping one another, treating the, comp treating the competition as the celebration of the learning that has happened to that point, which is what it is. It's not cutthroat competition. It is a celebration. The students dress up. They do it with a great deal of style. And it's very, very nice to see 20-year-old men giving each other a hug after they've just had a competition. That's the right stuff, and we want very much to keep that alive. There are lots of stories about that sort of activity in the first competition. I will uh, spare you some of those. Now, I think uh, Goldman has some very, very powerful points in the book Emotional Intelligence, and I think it is very, very much a part of hard fun. When you push really hard, you know, to me, it is very clear that pressure is a major part of creativity. We don't do creative things for the most part, unless we have to. It's hard. We do them when we're running or doing other things, but in fact, they don't just fall out. So dealing with the pressure is a very important thing. I tell the students that they have to learn to make friends with the knot in their stomach and recognize it as an asset. I have a knot in my stomach today. It's part of life. It's there. You learn to use it rather than block you. There's another part of emotional intelligence, though, that is, is best illustrated by a tragic story that, that goes with first. In the early years, a large company uh, worked with a school in a very, very rough part of the town where the company was located. And that year, the finals were in Manchester, New Hampshire. They came, President Bush was campaigning. He came by, met the students, drove their machine. Students were then in a, in a gymnasium with several thousand people cheering, bands playing, cheerleaders, the whole thing. It was an amazing celebration. The linkage that developed between the high school students and the engineers in this company was just phenomenal. One of the, com one of the students got home, returned to the same old stuff, committed suicide the next day, and left a note explaining that as far as he could tell, he had reached the peak, and it was never going to be that good again. So in that particular instance, 
many, many alarms went off and we have learned something about reentry. If we take people out of an environment that has no opportunity and bury them in opportunity, we have to be careful about letting them slip back into that. So there are many kinds of mo emotional intelligence that are, I think, inherent in, in hard fun. Forgiveness is another thing that's very important. The students have to learn to trust one another. They have to, you know, when someone fails to deliver their part of something on time, they have to forgive them, recognize what's the agenda that has to move ahead and get back to the business. For me, that skydiving thing was a wonderful piece of learning for me because I went out the week before, they said, you can go do one if you want to do one before the shoot. I said, great, I've always wanted to do that. I went out and went through the training course. During the dive, you have to do a whole bunch of things the instructors are telling you to do. You know, you have to look at the ride and you have to read your, your altimeter. You have to look at the person on the left, look at the person on the right. And I knew that the next week I was going to be asked to do lines in between. And you have to go through that four cycles before you pull the cord. The jump master had to keep me from pulling the wrong cord because I was thinking about all these other things. And when I realized what had happened or what, you know, what I had almost done wrong, I was really hard on myself, and I was going into my first TV shoot beating myself up for hours about how can I have done something so dumb, I'm going to be there, there's going to be a camera plane, camera and the airplane, camera and the other guy's helmet, there's going to be all this stuff going on and I'm not going to do the right thing. About Thursday of the week before I did the jump on Saturday, I finally decided, what do you got to forgive yourself and get on with it? And I think that's one of the lessons. Robin Kasserman's book makes that point very, very well. I think it's an important part of hard fun. If we have to help the students pull this nice sweep over some of the difficult parts. Partway through a big complex project, things are going rough. But after it's over, it feels good. And you want to keep that in mind and recognize that that's where you think you want to get. In thinking about this, I thought that, you know, the cup of knowledge and stuff is just too much too big. All we can do is kind of set the boundary conditions right. You know, the best we can do is build a foundation, as in the bricks, and have people start to learn about themselves, learn about nature, and learn about people. And I made an arrow pointed up and then realized quite accidentally I'd made an image of a house. And given that house of quality is a big deal, I decided this must be the house of qualities. But I think this is one of the representations of what we're trying to do here, set the boundary conditions right so that growth happens. Now, learning about nature is the thing that we've, we've done well at MIT for a long time. Um, that might be what you call physics. It's uh, one of the things that you do have to come to understand, though, is that she will not give you a reprieve even for a nanosecond. She sticks to the rules all the time. And students in their first design project are very, very inclined toward wishful thinking. And that's a designer's worst enemy. <laughs> Learning about yourself, you know, as I mentioned, uh, having a creative self-image is very, very important. You have to be able to rely on that. You learn lots of other things, and that list could go on and on. You learn about other people. You, know, you learn about how to deal with other folks. This thing that I mentioned about the bonding that happens when a team works together and how you have to learn to give up part of the project and trust somebody else to do it, the process of sharing. So another part of this thing is learning about society, you know, the deal that's made when you become a professional. You get to stand on the shoulders of the giants in exchange for an obligation to do the right thing when you're up there and can see a long way. Students designing this scooter, for instance, had to think really hard about the safety implications of it. And I think they did a very responsible job. They made sure that the brakes were really quite good. The students that, de that designed that, that battery-operated uh, water scooter for kids went through a lot of experiments and stuff about the length of kids' hair and how far back the propeller had to be from the grid to keep hair from getting trapped in there so that no one could get held underwater by. When the projects become real, the ethics become much more obvious and an integral part of what they're doing. Now, another cut on this is, uh, is Gardner's. You know, I think he, he's up to eight or so now. I, I, I think eight's probably a pretty big number, but I do think it's very clear that there are different kinds of intelligence. Someone once summarized uh, the multiple intelligence thing in this way, and I think that 
That's probably pretty close. Uh, we need some of all of those, but various of us are stronger in various suits. And I think if you look at that, you know, there are, uh, there are some skills and tools, CAE, CAD, et cetera, that can help you in being smart, but judgment is probably what it's really about. If you uh, look at the people smart thing, there are some planning tools and computer aids and lots to learn from the Sloan School, but leadership is probably what it's really all about. And if you look at situation smart, there are a lot of ways to apply logic and think very carefully, but wisdom is probably what you're really talking about. And again, I think Einstein was right when he said, wisdom is knowing what's important. So we try to get students involved in bumping into all of those things. Now, it ain't easy. There are some troubles. There, you know, things are not as simple as they might seem. I have a doctoral student named Ben Linder, great student. He's doing a thesis on estimation, a doctoral thesis. Because of his thesis, we have gathered data from seniors in mechanical engineering from six of the 12 most highly rated schools of engineering in the country. I'm just going to focus on one part of that data. We ask them to take five minutes to estimate the energy content of a nine volt transistor battery, one of these things, one of these things that we all know very well. The data, we have lots of data, so it's, it's statistically significant data. It's, uh, it's here. I don't expect you to see that, but the sad thing is there's only data from about 80% of the students because 20% of them use the wrong units for energy. Now, another cut on this is, uh, is Gardner's. You know, I think he, he's up to eight or so now. I, I, I think eight's probably a pretty big number, but I do think it's very clear that there are different kinds of intelligence. Someone once summarized uh, the multiple intelligence thing in this way, and I think that that's probably pretty close. Uh, we need some of all of those, but various of us are stronger in various suits. And I think if you look at that, you know, there are, uh, there are some skills and tools, CAE, CAD, et cetera, that can help you in being smart, but judgment is probably what it's really about. If you uh, look at the people smart thing, there are some planning tools and computer aids and lots to learn from the Sloan School, but leadership is probably what it's really all about. And if you look at situation smart, there are a lot of ways to apply logic and think very carefully, but wisdom is probably what you're really talking about. And again, I think Einstein was right when he said, wisdom is knowing what's important. So we try to get students involved in bumping into all of those things. Now, it ain't easy. There are some troubles. There, you know, things are not as simple as they might seem. I have a doctoral student named Ben Linder, great student. He's doing a thesis on estimation, a doctoral thesis. Because of his thesis, we have gathered data from seniors in mechanical engineering from six of the 12 most highly rated schools of engineering in the country. I'm just going to focus on one part of that data. We ask them to take five minutes to estimate the energy content of a nine volt transistor battery one of these things, one of these things that we all know very well. The data, we have lots of data, so it's, it's statistically significant data. It's, uh, it's here. I don't expect you to see that, but the sad thing is there's only data from about 80% of the students because 20% of them use the wrong units for energy, so we couldn't plot that. The scatter in the data is merely a billion to one. <laughs> so somehow we've missed making the numbers mean anything. You know, the students don't know whether a nine volt transistor battery could make a butterfly's wing flap once or carry an automobile all the way across the United States or is equivalent to a thermonuclear device. A billion is a big number. And we're giving these folks incredibly powerful tools to work with and in order for them to do the ethically proper thing, we have to make sure that they understand. Here's another kind of uh, spooky book. I, I left the image of the tattered book because it's, it's kind of old. It's you know, about 1960 or something like that. 
This guy named Perry was a, with a working group at Harvard. Probably a lot of you know about the work. Did some studies about intellectual and ethical development in the college years, a scheme. And my uh, terrible condensation of what he said is that when you arrive at college, you live in a nice black and white dual world, and the professor always knows what's right, and homework problems are either right or wrong. And you go through some real angst and struggle because you find out the boundaries are fuzzy, and sometimes you don't know what's important, and it gets a little complex, and then you come out thinking, wow, I'm really committed to complex intellectual ideas, and I can handle complex thoughts. Some folks have studied graduates of technical uh, institutes like MIT and liberal arts colleges some years ago and claim that the technical graduates come out kind of in the bottom of the bag and the liberal arts people come out about halfway up the arrow. I think that's, I don't buy that. I think that that particular scheme doesn't take into account some of the very fundamental issues that it should. But I think there is a signal in that noise, and I think we need to pay, pay attention to it. In fact, I think we're obligated to work really hard to get better at using hard fun and other things to get across the complex nature of the whole thing. Now, another thing that I think is very important is pointed out by our colleague Mike Gertusos in his new book, What Will Be. He talks about information work, and there are lots of authors like uh, uh, Ali Noam and uh, uh, the, uh, the head of Xerox PARC in, in the paper Universities in the Digital World, uh, John Seeley Brown. A lot of smart people are pointing out that things are changing in the world and they have potential big impact on the university. And I think that's really true. And I think we have to be very careful and make sure that we make that an asset rather than a liability. But that's the... Uh, subject of another talk. One of the things that is very clear, though, is that we have to understand what the core benefit of a place like MIT is. And I happen to think that it has to do with making sure that we address the really high margin things. Informed, creative thinking is, I think, where it is. And I, don't, I, I think lots of people agree with that. And I think we get at that by giving them the right mix of thinking, doing, sharing, and our incoming chairman of the faculty, Lottie Balin, just heard me say this the other day and pointed out that I was leaving out reflecting, and I think she's absolutely right that that's a very important part of the formula. Now, what that means to me is that being here for four years or longer primarily derives value from the community. You're with a whole group of people who are raising the bar, helping you develop a new self-image of yourself so that you have greater self-expectation and the assumption that you're going to do something when you leave here. <laughs> now, what that means, I think, is that nerd pride needs to continue to blossom and have some other obvious dimensions. Life is not a homework assignment. There's a lot more to it than that. And if you, uh, if you start looking, if we were really successful, we would get students to think about what my colleague Don Schoen argues in The Reflective Practitioner, that there isn't even a right way to do things. You know, if you look at the reflective practitioners in architecture or medicine or engineering, they all do things in different ways, and there's no right or wrong way. You need to understand and develop your own philosophy about how you're going to do things. In fact, if you, if you go even further out and listen to people like Capra, you know, the way of physics, the Tao of physics, um, there's a great oneness. You know, maybe it is that modern physics and Eastern mysticism are all the same. I don't quite go that far, but I think this book makes some very powerful points about how maybe we shouldn't draw lines like I did earlier in this talk about learning, that separate learning about yourself from learning about others, from learning about Mother Nature. It's clear, though, that these sorts of things are really becoming much more important 
and much more integral to the whole thing. And I think it is absolutely clear also that the new Cold War is education. There is nothing more closely coupled to either our standard of living or our quality of life than the success or failure of our education system. And I think we need a Cold War of the same scale as the last one. Now, one of the problems that we face is this one, that societies get the best of what they celebrate. Uh, that's really frustrating to me in some sense. A multi-billion dollar engineering feat, and it was named after a guy who can hit a rock with a stick. <laughs> no, I, I like sports, I do sports, I, I participate in lots of sports, but what, what were we doing? What, what went, where were we celebrating the evolutionary scale? I understand that Ted Williams was not even nice to the baseball fans in Boston. There were literally thousands of people in the Boston area in the last few decades who have made really meaningful contributions to society. But we took this big thing and did that. So with that slide up, I'd like to show you a clip from coverage of last year's first, where you see a young woman named Serena Kay making a uh, 19 seconds of comments, and then I'll close. Themselves. Three years ago, if I would have called my dad at 9 o'clock at night and said, Dad, I'm in E-Systems working on the robot, he would have been like, yeah, right, where are you? You know, he wouldn't have believed me. And at the beginning of this, they didn't believe me. I started realizing how important these years are for my later years, that, you know, I need to work hard now and I need to get my life on track if I want to do anything. And that's the true spirit of U.S. First. I changed a lot more than, I, like, it appeared I did. But I grew up a lot more, and I think my parents have realized that. They trust me a lot more. Serena Kay, just one of the many U.S. First stories we've heard here today. Now for the results of okay. the last round. Whoever... My closing slide comes from uh, my favorite poet, the Sufi mystic poet Rumi. And I think we at MIT and all of you guys have to do this. You know, we have to make sure that we've got the right big picture but we've got to get all of our ducks in a row while we're working that out. And we've got some immediate things. We've got to have many layers of horizons, and we've got to get them all in order. Now, <clears throat> thank you very much. I, I would like now to turn the program over to Craig Ramsell, and Boom Whacker's rule will become obvious. I think most of you have no clue what boomwhackers are. And I'm going to start by telling you that neither do I. But I'm going to do my best with them. And I actually understand that I'm out of time. So I think what's going to happen is you're going to take a boomwhacker home. Just kidding. We're going to actually do something with them here. It sounds like some of you are already doing something with them here. But before I get too far into that, let me thank Beth Garvin and Woody Flowers for having the vision to get you all participating today. And we're done listening for a while, and we're going to do some participating. I would also like to say that when we get everybody going in here, it could get a little loud. So maybe if those of you that have any kind of hearing assisted devices going on may need to take them down a notch. Um, what else? I would also like to acknowledge a man by the name of Arthur Hull, who has been my biggest uh, customer, biggest fan, who does these kinds of events all the time uh, for corporate clients as a team building exercise. What a gig. I mean, what a gig. He just flies around and does this for people, and, and they're having a good time. Now, we have an excellent assembly of people who have rehearsed all of about two minutes with these. And I promised Woody that I usually just completely wing these things, but this time we're actually doing a couple of rehearsed songs. So um, we'll get into that. The first thing I want you to do when you get your tube in hand, and it looks like they're getting out there pretty fast, make sure you all have one, preferably just one. 
you'll be much less confused. Not that MIT grads can't handle it. But we'll just find out, won't we? Um, I do want to tell a, a, a quick couple of little anecdotes while you're putting these out that uh, I stayed in a dorm for the first time. I was in Theta Delta Chi fraternity when I was here, and I stayed in a dorm for the first time, and there's this wonderful communal bathroom experience. And you go in and you sit on the toilet on one side, and it's got this kind of a seesaw effect. And somebody sits down on the other one, and you think you're going to like launch out James Bond style out of your Aston Martin. But so far, we're, we're surviving. Um, Boomwhackers, I've been asked, where did these come from? And, and, and I usually respond with, well, where do ideas come from anyway? And um, whatever you want to call that source of intelligence that we are all fortunate enough to tap into now and then. But there was a, a, a literal inspiration, and it was a cardboard tube from a roll of gift wrap paper. And I was living somewhere where they were recycling cardboard, but it had to be a two by two foot square, and this thing was three foot long, and I, oh geez, you know, it's gonna be sticking out, and these guys are gonna leave it sitting on the curb because I'm not following directions. I cut it in two, and then the magic came. I was not a drummer, still am not a drummer, but I'm trying. And I went doo -doo -doo -doo, like this, and I go, wow, that sounds pretty good. It's cardboard tubes, and, 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 and the tones are different. I go, mmm. One's longer than the other one. I didn't cut it exactly in half. I think this is like a musical principle that's been around for a while. <laughs> so I immediately beat the tubes up to the point where you could hardly hear them do anything anymore and ran across the street to the neighbor and said, I got a great idea for a new musical instrument. Watch. And they go, oh, Craig, you know, I mean, you've been having some health problems, and we're really, but we're really worried about you. Please don't just jump at the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, I ignored them, I did, and, and now we have boomwhackers. So you've been extremely, extremely quiet with these. The last time this many were handed out, you wouldn't have been able to hear me. So thank you for that. The first thing I want you to do is to tune your instrument. Now you're laughing, I know it only produces one note, but if they get a little bit out of shape, if they look at the end, if it's oval, you want to kind of smoosh it down and make it round again. And you're going to find out that it becomes much more sonorous that way. And I will tell you two more things. One is, I looked at putting LEDs on here, but it didn't pass the cost-benefit analysis. And they were designed with pod palm. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Okay, let it rip, this is rumble, or cutting loose. I'll give you some signals. This is taking the volume up. This is bringing the volume down. Quieter, quieter, take it down. Back up again, back up again. We're gonna go up again. All right. Now I'm gonna give you a count of four, and on one, keep going, keep going, keep going. I'm gonna give you a count of four on one. Everybody's gonna stop, I'm gonna go like that, okay? You too. Welcome. Okay, one, two, three, four, boom! Ah. Uh. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. Rumble. Rumble, 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 all right, let's do a song. This, and again, this is where I would normally wing it, but, but to uh, accommodate Woody here, I've actually like mapped this out. And it might help with the rehearsal too, so. Um, okay, we're gonna go. I need my tubes, where are my tubes? You guys got your tubes. Let's get them out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you wanna come up there and play? I could use some help. All right, there we go. All right, this is called Tech Tool. And it goes like. Now, I'm sorry, hang on. Everybody has got your tone. You do what I do. If everything goes well, these guys do what I do. And then you can do what they do, because I'm going to move on to something else. So you follow your person on stage. All right, so here we go. 
And you can hit the palm of your hand if you want. The head starts to hurt after a while. Thighs, back of the chair in front of you, as long as somebody else isn't gonna get whacked when you do it. All right, let's keep that going. What am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. How come we got an extra short red? Have I got a purple? Okay. The colors are musical tones. They think you need an explanation. I'm giving you an explanation. Long red is a C, orange is a D, yellow is an E, green, teal, whatever. G, purple, A, little red, octave on the C, high C. I'm missing, a, am I missing a two? I don't have my purple. There, there's green, I got two greens. How bizarre, no purple. This is very strange. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, here it is. Okay, now we got it, thank you, Woody. You guys are doing great. Yeah, I think you got it down. Let's see what we do. All right, we're gonna do purple and orange. This is so much easier when you're not trying to plan it. Okay. Purple, orange, purple, orange. Short red, yellow, and short red. Yellow, short red. to me. Okay, this is my secret weapon. Okay, one more signal here. This is going to be the speed it up signal. So we're going to do it like this. Take it up. If you haven't destroyed your hands yet. Okay, take them down. All right, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. Back up. Back up. Back up. One, two, three, four, boom. Hey! Congratulations. We'll do one more quick thing here. I want to just get a sound of just the individual tones. So let's start from the long one here, the red, and work our way up. Red, let's hear a long red. Okay. Orange, orange up, red down, red out. Orange, orange down, yellow up. Yellow down, green up. Green down, purple up. Purple down, short red up. There you have it. Pentatonic scale, major pentatonic scale, Q of C. <sighs> Thank you. All right, let me, there's a couple closing, couple closing things. There was just a couple things. Um, I'm not sure what you were instructed to say as opposed to me. So what I'd like to do is, is say, my understanding is you're welcome to take your tubes home. And if you decide you'd rather not, there's going to be a place where they're collected. Correct, Beth? Out here somewhere. And they'll get off to someone deserving, and, uh, which is not me, <laughs> by the way. And we do have a limited number of sets for sale uh, at the expo. It'll take us a little while to get over there, but it's probably roughly between one and three that uh, will be there, and uh, please come by and see us, even if you don't want to buy some, just to have a little more fun. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. Fantastic. The Technology Day luncheon is now in the Johnson Athletic Center um, all afternoon. There is a um, terrific uh, expo in Solid de Puerto Rico, and starting from three to five are the panels. So. 
Get out there and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for coming.